Welcome to the Forger Summit, everybody. Thank you for coming today. This is our Sunday edition. We have lots of awesome programming up in store for you all. And um, we have Justine Jen starting us off here in just a few moments. Um, before we get going, I just wanted to give a shout out to some of our sponsors who are making this all possible. And um, shout out to all of you for coming and supporting in the various ways that you do. Um, our main intention is to just create a community and, and cross pollinate and myceliate around, um, you know, earth, earth repair, regeneration, foraging, just all these amazing earth skills that are, are so needed this time. So um, briefly, um, Kyle, would you go ahead and uh, do our first ad for the day for Micah Rising? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Mycorrhizing is here to build a growing community. Mycorrhizing is held here to help people grow therapeutic tools in the comfort of their own home. The decriminalization of psilocybin containing mushrooms and other naturally occurring psychedelic substances is a rapidly expanding movement that has impacted 14 US cities and the entire state of Oregon. With classes like Ready, Set, Grow, Michael Rising is here to help you cultivate a relationship with sacred mushrooms by offering one single method of cultivation for new growers to overcome the anxiety of trying something new and foreign. Seth Warner, the founder, founder of Michael Rising, has taught his cultivation classes to thousands of students since 2019 and is ready to teach you as well. With growing kits to make the process even easier, all you need to know is that Seth's job isn't done until you have mushrooms in hand. So you can join his newsletter at uh, mycorrhizingfungi.com and uh, please do the work to learn your local laws before deciding that growing your own mushrooms is right for you. And uh, Brian went and put that link right there in the chat. Uh, oh, he sent it to me actually. Whoops, I'll send it to everybody. Yeah, something to know about some rules of engagement for um, just talking. We're just basically using the chat as our way to ask questions. And we'll have five to 10 minutes at the end of each presentation for our Q&A session. So if you want to hold your questions until that point on um, that last five or 10 minutes, that could be helpful um, for us to be able to kind of orient. Um, and also when you're chatting, sometimes if someone sends you a direct message, it will, you will automatically be chatting just to them so make sure your, your settings are to where you're chatting to everyone um, if you want your message to be going to everyone so here's that link for our micro rising sponsor big thanks to him and uh yeah i think that's it for now we'll get underway and i'll let you go ahead and do that intro for for justine all right well thank you for being here justine um it's nice to uh, meet you and everything and uh, justine is with us from oxford uk uh, she organizes forging guided tours in some of the beautiful wild areas of Oxford, and she teaches how to identify, harvest, and embrace wild plants with a sustainable approach. Uh, she's a trained herbalist that will help you understand the impacts of plants on your physical and mental health, but also their role in the local biodiversity. And she teaches wildcrafting and wild cooking workshops. Um, yeah, and her um, her her handle on Instagram is Ma Romka. Is that, am I saying that right, Justine? Yeah, Ma Romka. Okay. So um, what? It, go ahead. Go ahead. Great. Well, um, it's really really nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me, both of you. Thank you so much. It's really really nice to be chatting um, to people from a little bit further because. I consider myself someone who is really local focused. My whole life evolves around what's happening around me. And even the way I live, um, I live on a cooperative um, community uh, that is also a hemp farm. So I live on a, on a very small, low key hemp farm and we live as a commune. So we're trying to be as self-sufficient as we can. Um, so sometimes maybe I do forget there's a whole world out there because I am right in the middle of the countryside, a bit closer to Oxford than London, than London, but I'm kind of in between Oxford and London. Um, I do focus most of my teaching in Oxford, 
But that's because there are great opportunities to teach different students from the unis in Oxford. And um, my approach of teaching is actually to make foraging uh, approachable because I was really lucky to grow up with a grandfather um, who was a healer and herbalist. His name of practice was Maruemka, hence why I am now called Maruemka. So that was his name of practice. Um, and that's almost like a totem word for my family. So it's something quite personal, but I've decided to share. Um, it's no longer present, but it kind of is because obviously the name still goes on. Um, so I remember me when I started um, wanting to take on some foraging courses to just try to learn a bit more, you know, have different influences because you're always going to learn something different from someone you meet, right? Like we all have very different ways to channel communication. Um, and I was like, okay, I just arrived in the UK and I was four years ago now. Um, I really want to connect with some foragers in this land. As you heard, I'm French. I mean, <laughs> um, and I, I've been, I left France about 10 years ago um, to travel a lot uh, and discover just uh, biodiversity all around the world. Um, but when I settled in the UK four years ago, I remember trying to look around for foragers to learn from. And I remember being a little bit overwhelmed about how, first of all, expensive it was you know, to just reach out and learn and take on a foraging course. And I thought, wow, okay, well, that's fine. I can just pay this because the knowledge I'm going to get is some sort of like lifelong knowledge. So I accept, but there was something in me that wouldn't settle so right because I come from Dunkirk, which is, you know, working class kind of background. And I really believe that knowledge needs to be accessible and nature is something that really is not that accessible but for a lot of people, especially from the United States. So when I decided to start teaching in Oxford, um, that's where I really uh, put my focus. So it was three years ago. I've been teaching foraging for three years now. Um, and uh, my really big focus was to drag nature into the East States. And let's see how that functions. And the beauty is because obviously learning about your biodiversity and your local flora and even the fauna um, really helps you to feel integrated. And it really helps you to um, some sort of like grow a community around you on a different level. And then you start understanding how can you bring medicine to your life, you know, how can you just learn a bit more about what can you find around you? And that's the kind of things I've been doing a lot in Oxford. Um, it's going really well. I'm really enjoying it. Where I'm really lucky is that England is quite a small country that is all owned, the whole of it is owned, which has its downsides, but also the really bright side of it is that nature is really well preserved here there are people looking after the land. And, and that's something that's quite comforting as a thought. Um, that also means um, there is an incredible diversity of plants to be foraged and mushrooms. Now we are reaching, I mean, I was gonna say we, we're supposed to be in some sort of like mid winter, but as I looked around today, uh, it really looks like spring. I don't know how it's like uh, at yours, but around here, spring have sprouted, which means I uh, have um, hurried to forage some roots because roots is something that you can get a lot of medicine from and the best time of the year to forage for roots will be in fall and winter. And nowadays, obviously seasons are changing and we have to adapt and it's okay, we can adapt. We're really good at adapting, but that means we also have to be really attentive. So for me, when it comes to foraging, one of the most important thing or advice I suggest would be to be really observant. Because yes, maybe spring is supposed to arrive in March, but right now I can see spring is around. So I'm gonna uh, hurry to forage my roots <laughs> before too many grains come out. And then most of the nutrients will then be gathered and focused in these young shoots. Because that's kind of what happens in the winter, isn't it? 
when the plants go through the whole year cycle, slowly start dying off, but really, it's not really dying, it's just regenerating its roots. Oh. Uh, no, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, for the perennial plants, um, they are really focused on regenerating those roots for winter, which makes it a really prime time for root foraging. Now, I really love working with roots because you get a lot of nutrients, a lot of medicine and a lot of carbs. I feel like carbs is always a subject that comes up with foragers. Okay, you eat some leaves and flowers and that's great, but do you really sustain off leaves and flowers? Well, you could, to be honest, but in the, for the carbs, you can always find them. If not in mushrooms, you will find them in roots. But what's important to know is to uh, learn how to preserve those carbs, you know, preserve that medicine so like that you can really carry uh, that specific root all year round until you can forage it again. It's actually the hardest part really as a forager is to learn how to preserve. And that can just mean pickling, extracting, fermenting. Fermenting is a big one and is a fun one to do as well. Um, now I've been really lucky because um, I moved into Hempen, which is a cooperative hemp farm um, last year. I say I'm really lucky because it's on an estate called Hardwick Estate and it's really beautiful and really wild and local people really allow me to take groups foraging. Because that's something to be mindful about as well as a forager, as someone who teaches, is that how often can I bring groups into the same spot? Is this really sustainable to bring people in the same spot week after week? Well, obviously, no, it's not, you know, because you can never really control what are people going to do with this brand new knowledge um, that you just taught them. So what I've been trying to do around Oxford is to um, really um, alternate the different locations where I teach. And what's really beautiful about it is that I've got now my regulars because it's been three years I teach. So I have my regulars who come like once per season, if not twice. But by taking them to different locations, I allow them to meet a different type of nature, but also a different type of community. And that's where I really, really um, some, sort of focus my work is that bringing community together around nature because Ultimately, that's what we all have in common, you know, as humans, like nature, you know. And I find that in Oxford, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's really good to speak to all of you actually, because I can imagine when you think about Oxford, you think like, wow, yeah, amazing, some sort of like student's um, life and beautiful town and, you know, yeah, and that's the truth, it is. But that means there's also a big division between well, the sort of middle upper class and the working class. And I'm trying to bring those classes together for foraging. And that's something I'm really, really, really trying hard to do, you know, and it's working, it's working because there's no better way to connect with someone than find the common grounds. And as I mentioned earlier, I think foraging and nature is just the most common ground we can have, surely, surely. Um, I'm, I'm actually talking, I was going to take you out. Um, my hopes was for uh, the sun to decide to set much later today, but it did not because it's still winter. Um, so if I take you out right now, it's going to be really dark. Um, so I'm calling, I'm talking to you from the lab um, in Hampen. Um, that's where I work. Um, so in here, I take care of all of the production. So working with, you know, CBD and hemp seed oil, but uh, also bringing a lot of forage elements uh, into the different product recrafting. And that's where I've got a massive interest at the moment. Um, I, uh, I work with many, many, many different cannabinoids, but I'm really trying to bring local medicine um, into uh, all of those different plants we're extracting here. Um, because there's no better uh, medicine. I, you hit the mute button on accident, I think, Justine.
Let's see. I'm asking to unmute. There we go. Here we go. Sorry about that. No worries. It's a questionable, uh, questionable um, Wi-Fi in here, but it should be okay. It should be okay. You're looking good. Yeah. So um, let's go back onto root foraging. Um, so. There's different types of plants, the biennial annual plants that will have a one year cycle, biennial plants that will have a two year cycle and perennial plants that come back every year. So when it comes to root foraging, this is something you have to learn, you know, what type of plant are you dealing with? Because imagine if you think about burdock, most burdock plants will be biennials. Sometimes they carry it through a third year. There's always an exception. This is you know, what life is like anyway. But when it comes to biennial plants, you have to be aware, what was it the first year or the second year? Because when you want to forage the roots, you want to make sure you forage it between the first and the second year. And that's really important. The perennial plants is a little bit easier. You can just pull it out. And I've got some amazing root out here, like um, mugwort. I'm sure you know about mugwort. Uh, mugwort is a plant that grows pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's almost considered a weed here, and I absolutely adore foraging mugwort because I use it at all its stages. Whether it's going to be the really young leaves in spring, which are actually already showing up, which is crazy, it's January. I know, it's just crazy. Uh, but the young leaves is something that I'm just going to eat. It's really potent in volatile oils, it's really strong in flavor, but I really love it. So you can always um, simmer some young mugwort leaves. I love to use the stalks. I love to use the flowers for the tujon content and the whole lucid dreaming. Um, but right now, the part of the plant I decided to forage is the roots. And that is because the roots can make a really amazing tonic plant. And that's kind of what I'm going to do today. I want to teach you how to make a very simple blood tonic with roots that are very easy to forage, like mugwort. Um, so I've got some mugwort root, root right here. Can you see it properly? Yeah, kind of. Good enough. Good enough. Um, obviously, so this is the upper part of the plants. Um, this is what used to be flowers. It's not that easy to identify right now because obviously all the seeds have been dropped everywhere and now the plant still has a scent to it, to be honest. And it's actually something I really love to work with when I brew beer. I always wait for the mugwort to die off, to forage it and to brew beer with it. And that is because when the flowers are out, the volatile oils are a bit too potent and I feel like I end up with a very fumed beer and I like something a bit more round. Um, but that happens for a lot of plants. It's not because the flowers have died off and the seeds have now spread it that you can't be using these plants anymore, you know, even just for the flavor, not just for the medicine. And that's what you do when it comes to brewing. But right now, I got the roots here. So I've got my amazing uh, mugwort roots right here. And so I've got a few more roots that I'm gonna show you. And that's something I like to do each season to craft a blood tonic for various reasons. One of them is I'm a woman. So each month I can do with a little bit of blood tonic, you know, put into my body, put into my system. But that's something that can apply for anybody, you know, no gender on it. Um, so what mugwort root is going to do is that it's going to act as really good astringent tonic kind of plant. So that's something you want, especially in the winter, you know, when feeling a little bit so. Then, that is probably a plant that you are very familiarized with, um, curly duck roots. So now I wish I could show you the leaves, but the leaves were not quite out yet. Um, and what I've done in this land where I live is that I, I, I have a little map um, and I literally drew a little map and I've marked where everything is. And that's quite a good advice as a forager um, to make sure you mark where can you find different types of plants. Just to remember, because that's the same with the burdock, once the leaves have died off, well, how are you gonna find that root? 
if you've not marked it. Um, and that's what I did uh, with my uh, curly dog. Now, curly dog is something, is a plant that looks uh, extremely similar to the broadleaf dog. And the broadleaf dog is the plant that everybody knows for nettle stings. Now it is true that it helps with nettle stings. It will cool it down on the moment. And so curly dog is basically the pretty much the same plant with much more narrow uh, leaves, really curly on the edges. It's quite, um, it's quite a simple um, venation on the curly dogs. Um, and they often have those little red blotched on them. That really helps identifying. So I've got my curly dog and my mugwort fruit right here, simply. Then I foraged some nettle roots. I don't think I need to teach you how to identify nettles. Um, but in case of doubt, touch it. If it doesn't sting you, it's probably not nettle. <laughs> but um, I've got some nettle. So what's happened here is that um, it has already started to sprout and show a few very young leaves. So I'm going to be eating them. What it means when a plant starts showing a few leaves is that it has shoot up a lot of the sugar and the medicine present in the roots in order to produce those beautiful, lush, uh, vigorous medicinal leaves that we love to mention in early spring. Um, so that is quite a clear indication that there might be a bit less inulin than other types of compounds in the roots right now. But that doesn't really have to be dismissed anyway. You know, it's still really young. So I still went ahead and forage a really nice big chunk of root here, which I'm just gonna kind of like roughly just roughly chop. So here I've got my nettle roots. I am the one to um, oh, never waste anything, never. So even if I'm not going to eat it, I'm just going to shove it into a brew I was doing somewhere. Maybe you can add some flavor. There's always something to get out of it. Or, you know, I'm just going to top it up somewhere. Uh, just don't throw it. And if ever you have to go down to the idea of throwing, just compost it. Simple as that. There's always, always life to be brought. Um, going back to the mushroom subject, um, you were talking about mycorrhizing. I mean, I wish I could talk to you about mushrooms, but there's not that many mushrooms going around at the moment. Turkey tail, um, mostly. Um, velvet chunks. <laughs> we have some velvet chunks, but they're getting a bit rarer at the moment. Um, then I have a root that, and the plants are really a dull. And it's called garlic mustard. So now I might be able to show you a bit more what the leaves look like because this little guy has showed up a few leaves. So garlic mustard is a biennial, which means on the first year is going to produce uh, leaves only, which are really lovely, a little bit bitter, but still really garlicky. I'll show you a close up in a minute. Um, and on the second year, garlic mustard as a biennial is going to then produce a, a much longer stem and, and a flower and then seed and then die off. You want to be harvesting the roots of garlic mustard from the fall of the first year all the way to the spring of the second year. Garlic mustard has a, a heart shape leaf that can also be called kidney shape, I suppose. Let me show you a bit more, mm, if I can, there we go. Now, one of the ally to uh, forage this plant, let me show you a little bit. This one, you can see it's been a little bit munched. But whenever you wonder what kind of plant you've been foraging, I cannot stress enough how the sense of smell is so important. It's almost like, close your eyes, try to close your eyes while you forage and smell everything and get really good at it because your sense of smell is gonna be one of your best ally. And it's also because sometimes when you smell a plant that's really toxic, your brain is gonna some, you know, digest that information. Um, so even if you don't remember the name of the plant, you're gonna smell it and 
you're going to have that message sent to your brain saying, oh, I remember that was toxic. I don't know what it is, but it was toxic anyway. And that's the same with edible plants. You're going to smell something and then you're going to be enticed. You're going to want to eat it. And that's because you know it's edible. Um, so whenever you forage, crush. Make sure you crush the leaves, again, to release some of the volatile oils uh, and roll them between your fingers and then smell it. Same for mushrooms. Um, when you forage mushrooms, just have a sniff. Sometimes you're going to be so surprised how delicious are those smells, you know, and how uh, helpful they are for the identification. So here I've got all of my garlic mustard roots with me. Um, they look very much like a little horseradish type of roots. And that's because they pretty much are um, same family, mustard family. Uh, and they are basically the equivalent of horseradish, but a little bit sweeter. So for, for a lot of people, even nicer. What they also have in common with horseradish is that they have incredible antifungal properties and antiviral properties. That's the kind of stuff you want to be aware of in the winter, right? Especially antiviral. So um, what I do simply, me, is that I just um, rip the roots out of the stem. And I'm going to keep those guys. I'm probably going to end up just eating them as such later in a sandwich or something like that, you know. Um, I'm quite a muncher uh, for young leaves, especially fresh ones in early spring. So what I do is take them off. Look at this beautiful color. I don't know if you're going to be able to see the purple in there. The garlic mustard roots just at the base of the stem it gets a really nice purple tinge oh, it is visible maybe and here i go i'm someone who uh, does not really work with precise measurements <laughs> when it comes to baking i will i will you have to but when it comes to crafting medicine i just think it's so important to be intuitive about it there is a reason why we have intuition, you know, and there is no better way to reclaim your intuition than spending a lot of time in nature and let yourself be drawn to different plants. And sometimes that can just be a, a big indication of what's happening inside. What kind of plant are you going to be drawn to, you know? Um, I know personally, I'm not going to go too deep in that subject, but um, Different plants I've been drawn to have showed me different uh, health conditions. I had that I had no idea about, you know? So yeah, just always wonder and trust your intuition. It's really important. Okay, I've got a nice big bunch of roots here now. <laughs> so I'm using roots that I have found around the farm where I live. Whatever route do you find if you have identified it to be edible and then identified the four different medicine you can get it from, shove it in there. There's no reason why not. You know, as long as it's edible and medicinal, there's no reason why you could then uh, add them up into the same jar, into the same medicine you're going to extract. It's only if you want to be really specific with the medicine you're crafting. For example, you know, if I would want to uh, focus on anemia, for example, let's say, okay, I suffer from anemia. Well, then what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna focus on plants that are really high in iron, like nettle roots and uh, curly dot roots. And those would be the two ones I'm gonna uh, chop and extract. But right now I'm focused on doing an overall blood tonic <clears throat> with local plants. The reason why it's also amazing to use local plants is because of the microbiome that's going to be available on those plants that's very similar to what your body needs and how your body is going to respond. It's like if I, if I imagine I order some nettle roots that has grown in the south of France. Yeah, great. Okay, I'm French. So you think maybe, maybe it's going to help. But no, there's absolutely no correlation because it grows from way too far from where I am right now. And that is why being a bit more aware of um, the availability you have locally is only going to improve your health on so many levels in such a gentle way as well. Um, I think we live in a society that goes really, really fast. 
And we forget that medicine takes time to apply. So like you've got a headache, yeah, okay, what are you gonna do? Uh, you're gonna take some sort of like pill and your headache's gonna go like in 10 minutes. And that's something we're really used to now. You could instead go seek some plants that contain some form of salicylic acid, like meadowsweet. We've got a lot of meadowsweet in Oxford and it contains salicylic acid. On a very small dose, very small level, um, in a almost like homeopathic level, it's very small, the amount of um, salicylic acid you find. But because it has grown locally, it's just, your body's gonna respond to it so much better which means you're gonna brew yourself a tea, a nice big tea. I don't know what you like, but I like to have like a, a massive like pint of tea, if I can. Uh, drink that. Your headache's not gonna go in five minutes, but if you just wait an hour, you'll be sorted. And it's all to do with the availability you have locally. So that's why I decided to craft my medicine with my local roots. It's very likely that unless you suffer from a really um, heavy um, condition, uh, you know, it's very likely that you can find what you need into your uh, local availability. So now my little trick, I'm gonna show you, gonna show you the jar a little bit here. I'm just gonna go like that. <laughs> you can't see but I'm like basically squatting. <laughs> it works. Um, I'm actually gonna roughly chop all of those roots, um, roughly chopping or even like ripping them with my bare hands, you know. Uh, it's also gonna help the extraction. So I'm just ripping it off, filling up a jar. So we've got four roots here. Um, mugwort roots, um, curly dog roots, uh, garlic mustard roots, uh, and nettle roots. So what I'm doing is that I am just chopping them really roughly with my hands, not really caring about measurements uh, because they will vary regarding the amounts you're going to forage. Um, and I know people do like measurement, people do like a recipe, um, but I don't, I try to really um, almost like inspire people to be creative with their own medicine. Like if I can do it, you can do it, you know, this is, Yes, there is a science behind, there is a method behind making medicine, but really your own needs uh, are individuals. So there's no, no one's gonna know better than yourself what do you need in your body. And the best way to get to know that is to really get involved, you know, start to learn a bit more about your plants, your local plants, be gentle about it, just learn the medicine of a plant per week or something like that, you know, don't rush it. Because if you rush it, you're going to lose, um, you know, forget all of the information. Um, so just be gentle with it. So I'm just doing this, just doing that. But I, one thing, if the area where your forehead is extremely clean and the soil is beautiful, organic, amazing, really like with an amazing availability of microbiome, brush it, you don't have to wash it too much. If it's not the case, make sure you wash your roots, you know. I know soil is health, but it's rare to find a beautiful soil out there. Uh, I'm quite lucky because our farm is organic. So we've got a big organic um, fields where I can then forage my beautiful roots um, and um, even munch on the soil if I want to. <laughs> okay, so here are all my roots. So you can see I've uh, just filled up a jar. And this is just my intention to show you how easy it can be to uh, craft your medicine, um, you know, with your bare hands, basically. <laughs> so I've got my jar, I've got all of my roots in there. I'm working that nettle root a little bit more, but it's because net nettle roots, it, um, it's really fibrous. And that's why you can make rope with it, you can make all sorts of fabric with nettle roots, but it also means if you're gonna uh, rip it off by your hands, it's gonna make it a little bit harder. Okay, here we go. This is it. It's piled in. So now I'm sure you're wondering, okay, so what you're gonna do is that you've got a, a jar full of roots uh, and nothing else. Well, in order to uh, 
pull out the medicinal compound of a plant, uh, there's no better solvent than alcohol. So now alcohol is a friend uh, if it's taken in a very small amount or if you use it as a solvent. Um, I am not suggesting anyone to be drinking every day. That is not going to be healthy. <laughs> But to pull out medicine from plants, um, alcohol is pretty amazing. If you don't want to have alcohol, you can use vinegar, knowing that even in vinegar, there is a very small, small, small percentage of alcohol because of fermentation. That's what naturally occurs when you ferment something. So my solution today, and that might, that might come across like a French of me, but it's like a, it's a really old recipe that I've, always been doing, taught by my grandparents, and is to use um, red wine. So I've got a bottle of red wine here, and um, red wine is an alcohol. It's not a high proof alcohol. This one might be 14%, you know, so the extraction is going to be quite gentle. But what it contains, because of the grapes, is a compound called resveratrol. Resveratrol um, is an incredible antioxidant. So on top of pulling out the medicine from various plants that you use, it's also going to have some therapeutic effect. Now, what you have to remember is that we are not going to be drinking this as a, as, a, as a pleasurable kind of alcohol. You know, this is pure medicine. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to submerge my roots. And back in the days when my grandmother would teach me how to do so, we would actually traditionally use nettle leaves, dried apricots, um, and molasses in a jar, submerged in red wine. And that's because all of those compounds are really high in iron. Then, so I've submerged all of my roots in there, simply in red wine. And um, well, the best way to store it is going to be out of sunlight. Um, sun just creates the perfect environment for bacteria to grow. Um, so it's always best to keep it just in a dark space, in, in, in a cool dark space, just so you can have some form of control over the extraction that's happening. You could let it extract for a very long time, but from two weeks, you are already going to have a lot of the area, iron, um, iron pulled out. Uh, of, of the roots I'm using now. And because it's very likely that in two weeks, I'm going to have plenty of more plants uh, foraged that I'm going to use, uh, I'm actually only going to let this extract for two weeks. So a good thing to do is to shake it daily. Shaking is going to really uh, help the extraction, the extraction. And then what you do after two weeks is strain the roots, compost them, <laughs> I can never stress enough the composting aspect. <laughs> Don't just throw it, compost. Um, and then have no more, and I must insist, no more than a shot a day if you're going to do a cure for a good blood tonic. I tend to do it when uh, I'm menstruating. I'll have my uh, iron tonic, um, I'll have a shot a day, and I'll do it for seven days in a row, and then for the rest of the month, I don't do it. And I kind of do, rotate like that, you know, every month for seven days, I'm gonna take in my iron tonic that I crafted, crafted myself with seasonal plants. Like right now, we're using roots, but it's very likely that uh, in two weeks, there's already gonna be a lot of young fresh nettles and that is then the part of the plants that I'm going to use and focus on. And like that, all year around. Eventually, I'll be working with flowers, and then I'll be working with fruits. The fruit season is the most exciting because obviously there's so much nutrition to get out of fruits, but we are quite far from that season. <laughs> I'm just getting excited. Um, but yeah, I think it's uh, crafting your own medicine and learning about the um, bioavailability of your local uh, ground is an amazing way to know yourself better and know your community better. Because what you must do once you learn that knowledge is to share it. Like it's so important to share. Medicine is now seen as this kind of like thing that's like 
oh, I'm not a doctor, or I can never heal myself. I was like, no, that's not true. Like, I'm sure there's someone in the community that knows something or knows a part, you know? And it's really all about sharing. And it's also why I, I, I tend to, I, I consciously took the decision to keep my forging courses at a really um, low price. Uh, and that's because I want to keep on making it really approachable. I just want to be sharing this knowledge. And I think the more of us know about how to heal ourselves and how to behave with our local nature, and the better this planet is going to be. Simple as that, right? Um, I am conscious. It's already been a while I'm chatting, uh, and there's a bit of space for questions. So maybe I should uh, leave some space for this now. Yeah, well, thank you for that presentation. That's so interesting. Interesting. I never thought to use red wine before. I never thought of that. So it's like amazing. an old French recipe, classic French. <laughs> but it's yeah, because you so can also, you, the best the best way really. I I also consciously decided to uh, show a bottle of wine, store bought wine, to make it a bit more approachable. But the best way would be to genuinely make your own wine. And then from your own wine, you extract your medicine, you know, like the whole like spectrum. Yeah, that's like a, a game changer for me on my end, because I know how to make, you know, wine and uh, ferment things and make little alcoholic drinks. And I had always thought that I would need to get a still or something, extract the alcohol if I wanted to make tinctures or medicines. But yeah, that's the game changer right there. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions for Justine, um, um, go ahead and put them here in the chat. Um, okay. It looks like we have Ellen um, asking um, when you mentioned um, what you had traditionally used with the nettle leaves and the dried apricots, there was uh, another ingredient that um, Ellen might have missed. She's just wondering if you could repeat that. Sorry. Oh, um, what was that traditional recipe that you said that you you make it with uh, nettle leaves, dried apricots, and what else? Uh, molasses. Ah, gotcha. Molasses. Okay. There's a couple of other questions too from a little further up in the chat. Um, Maggie's asking, do you store the strained tonic in the fridge or do you leave it at room temperature? And also, will it ever turn to vinegar? So um, you don't have to store it in, in the fridge. Um, the fridge will allow it to uh, just remain a bit more stable for a long time. But I mean, right now it's winter. I suppose in the summer, I might try to avoid leaving it out if it gets really hot, but it's because I live in a caravan and it gets really damp in there and really, really hot in there. So the always the best is to get a, a cupboard in, a, living room or the kitchen, or if you've got a garage, that's a perfect space for your garage. Um, it stays quite enough like cool and damp in there, but the dampness doesn't really matter because you've got a sealed jar anyway. Cool, so outside the fridge is totally fine. Yeah. But keep it cool and dark. Yeah. Again, it's, 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 it's because of the alcohol contents. Now, of course, it's not going to last for a very, very long time because we're not working with a uh, high proof alcohol like, like, you know, so you could find even things like gin, you know, is um, high proof enough to really stabilize the compounds. Red wine will turn over time, but that's, that's the practice I'm trying to teach is that make sure you are aware of how big is the batch you're making and keep in mind the next one you're gonna make, you know, see it as like a, almost like a two week cycle if you need, you know, to, to take that metal and tonic. For me, I kind of do once a month. Hmm. And I work with cool. uh, the um, local pot I've got available.
Yeah, so, so the next question here is that uh, you mentioned working intuitively with making medicine. And um, so um, woman animalistic is wondering, how do you balance working in the moment with intuition and having set recipes for sale to your customers? So I, um, I suppose if I would to sell my medicine um, as such, I would um, definitely need to have a set recipe, you know, um, but it's mostly to reassure customers, you know, so people understand exactly what they're taking. Um, I don't sell my own medicine. I teach how to make your own medicine. Now, I, uh, I've also been taught all of those practices, you know, myself, I've not sort of created, I created quite a few of my own recipe once I get enough confidence into making so. But usually what I do, if ever I come across a brand new recipe I've never seen before and I wanna work with, is that I'm gonna look at the ingredients and then uh, work with what I know, you know, my, my pre-established knowledge and then and work with my needs. Um, and then adapt, kind of adapt. Um, I think it's also having trial errors um, is, uh, is really important, you know, because this is gentle medicine we're working with, you know, so it's not gonna be, it's not gonna become dangerous in some levels because you're also gonna be mindful about how much you are in taking and always make sure you are using um, edible medicinal plants. I have some dandelion roots. I'm reading now. I've got the chat on the side. I'm all, I'm all set. <laughs> um, yes, so dandelion roots is amazing. You could use the exact same preparation for dandelion roots. It's really good to uh, balance hormone cycle as well. I don't know what you're working it for, but um, yeah, even add it with other roots. Um, it's going to be incredible. More on working with low income. Yeah, so uh, it's actually quite a big, big, if not the main topic for me, the low income basis of my customers. Um, I think when it comes to food insecurities, um, it's really important to acknowledge all of this matter, you know, and it's really important to acknowledge that not everybody has had the chance to grow up with just a garden even, you know. For a lot of people, it's been a street life and therefore a medicine is something you get into a pharmacy field. I think um, working with what you've got in your streets, just even like starting to be able to identify what you've got in your streets is amazing. Knowing that heavy metals is something that will gather in roots. So if you're going to forage uh, in streets, Roots is not something you can necessarily focus too much on because they are going to gather a lot of pollution. Then the stem will gather quite a lot of pollution, but then there's less heavy metals in the flowers and even less in the fruits. So imagine you've got an apple tree growing in your streets. Just don't stop yourself from picking them apples and make whatever you want with it, whether it's apple cider vinegar or medicine or whatnot, you know. Um, and I think it's like re-establishing that connection just with that apple tree that you've got in your streets. And that's, that's going to be the bridge. The bridge will be built from that point, you know, and you're going to start investigating a little bit more what you've got around you. Um, and again, red wine, you, you don't have to choose a fancy red wine to make that medicine, you know, like, at all, because the, the purpose of it is not to enjoy it as a, as a, a meaningful, some sort of like recreational drink. It's more as a medicine, so you are a bit more interested onto the action of the wine rather than the flavor of the wine itself. It's gonna be transformed anyway. I have a question for you, Justine. Yeah. Um, as far as harvesting those different roots that you showed, can you kind of speak to how you would harvest different ones? Like for example, how the the mugwort, you know, you can kind of harvest the runners from it and not kill the plant, but with certain plants like the dandelion, you might be killing the plant. I just wonder if you want to speak to that for people. Yeah, I mean, it's actually a really good question because you do want to be mindful about that. You know, once you uproot a plant, that's it, you know, that might be the end of 
this. So always make sure before you pull out a root that you might have seen an established root system. Um, like, uh, for example, if you think of, uh, oh, I've lost the video. Ah, hmm. yeah, I'm back. If I you can think see of you also, still. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it was my screen. If you think of horseradish, for example, horseradish is something you can just literally check, grab a chunk of the root and then don't even worry about it. There's going to be more horseradish growing about. If you're going to pull a mugwort root, again, mugwort is a plant that's really, really, really resilient and pretty established, but um, just be mindful of it and remember the intention. So are you going to pull this whole plant up for your own benefits? And that's fine to do that. That's okay. So you're going to plant some more after. It's completely fine. Or are you going to allow this plant to get a chance to regenerate itself by only harvesting a chunk? It doesn't really matter how precise you do it. Like plants are much more resilient than, than the way we cut them, basically. You know, it's just the same when you're gonna forage by bare hands. Okay. It's always better to chop or, or to just rip it. But for many reasons, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's just the intention is really important. So you are being more aware of what you're doing. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have time for one more question and then we're gonna um, thank you and then move on to our next speaker. But uh, let's, let's get this other question in while we have the time. Uh, it says, on working intuitively, were you speaking on just the plant chemicals speaking to you or does this also include trying to determine if there are other non-plant chemicals, like if something gross was dumped in the area where the plant grows. Yeah, absolutely. Oh my God, so much, so much, so much. Um, so when I talk about walking intuitively, uh, I talk about what plants just naturally draw you in. And that can be simply as uh, simple as like the design of a flower, like, oh, I really like that color. It's just it maybe a color, you know, but trying to think further, oh, okay, I like that plant. Why? Why then? Um, and then search a bit more about the plants. And even if it's a toxic plant, even if it's a deadly plant, there's probably a message in there for you, you know, trying to teach you something maybe about yourself. Then, um, yeah, if you're gonna work in a place where you see some gross stuff being dumped about, not gonna lie to you, that doesn't always stop me from foraging, like at all. I'm like, you know, I, I, yeah, okay, so this is gross, but that plant is beautiful and resilient. And that should not stop me from appreciating the beauty and the medicine of that plant just because there's that gross thing right next to it. And it's also down to the second time metabolites. Plants have a primary metabolites, which are going to be all of the compounds they build to grow. And then they're gonna have a second time metabolites, which are gonna be the compounds that they built in order to survive in the wild. Now, what's really interesting is that a lot of our medicine is part of, or are part of these secondary metabolites, like antifungal, uh, anti-inflammatory properties, all of those compounds are part of the secondary metabolites. So it's very likely that the more a plant struggles to survive, the more potent it gets into medicine. Just like us, the more we struggle, the more resilient we get. Totally, that, that's a perfect note right there to, to end things on, thank you for that. Um, and is there anywhere people can find you? I put your website and I put your Instagram on there. Is there anywhere else you'd like to direct people to or any classes or workshops or um, anything else you would like to direct people to while you have a uh, oh, attention? You, uh, you've showed my website, so that's wonderful. And thank you so much for that. Apart from that, no, this is my Instagram and this is my website. <laughs> and, this cool. is me. and people can um, people can join you for a live workshops yeah. in the UK. Is that right? Yeah, great, absolutely. great. I hope to make it over one day and get to experience that. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us and thank you for joining the Forager Summit. And thanks for all the questions and the comments that we've had in the chat. We've had some awesome, I mean, people are loving this, this content. I can tell people are really like engaging with it and sharing recipes and ideas. And it's great to have you all answering yes, each other's really questions really as well. Nice. Yeah. So y'all network with uh, Justine and follow her on Instagram and check out her website. And um, yeah, really grateful for you. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. Thank You're you, cool. Justine. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. Bye. Adios. Adios. All right. So up. Au revoir. Au revoir yes. <laughs> Au revoir. All right, so coming up next, we have Dandelion from Return to Nature. Really excited to have him on. Um, he's someone I've been following for a few years and talking back and forth with, and it's just an excellent source of knowledge and um, just a really excellent guy to listen to. So really excited to have him on. And Kyle's going to introduce him, and we're going to let, uh, let Dan take it away. All right. Um, yeah, so Dandelion is an earth herbalist, forager, musician, teacher. Uh, he teaches through Return to Nature, uh, providing classes, lectures, and seminars on wild food foraging, uh, mushroom identification, herbal medicine making, and as well as primitive and survival skills with the focus on wild foods and forest medicines. He also incorporates the philosophies of yoga, alchemy, meditation, and mysticism into his classes, lectures, and seminars and brings the deep rooted indigenous medicine and perspective of practicing intuition with plants in a systematic and earth-based way. And you can find out more about him at uh, returntonature.us. Um, so Dan, right. are you there? Hello friends, how's it going? There he is, how's it going? Pretty good, how are you? Doing well. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. Yeah, I really appreciate what y'all are doing. This has been awesome. I was just tuning in. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of things. And uh, it's uh, really great just to be around like-minded people who have the same goal and mission and give everybody a forum to kind of share the intention and perspective that they've been gaining through such a wide array of what is called foraging. So I appreciate all you people who even care that plants exist. Um, so what I really wanted to talk about is this idea I've been working with in New Jersey, um, which I kind of blanket as the cottage industry revolution um, and sort of break down some of that and maybe leave time for a little bit of discussion. So uh, 15 minutes for questions or discussions. How's that sound y'all? That's excellent, man. Cool, right on. So um, it's currently winter. There's about two foot of snow on the ground. Um, where I'm at right now, it hasn't melted. So we've basically got a snow fortress and I'm working on uh, raising funds for a Davis tent to have an outdoor education school for kids and adults. And the goal is to really have that be uh, funded, crowdfunded in a legitimate way by community members uh, based on the harvest and management of the ecosystem. And so the idea with that is to go kind of beyond permaculture. And, and so we have a framework of permaculture of bringing our gumi berries and our this is and our that's, which is great. And then the question of what did indigenous people live on and how can we sort of uh, uh, request of the ecosystem to uh, harvest invasive species all over the, let's just say for this talk, the, the, a nationalistic approach all over the country and develop basically our own ethos, um, largely based on something like Robin Wall Kimmerer's writings um, about the ethical harvest, you know, have like an ethical harvest ethos and really understand the difference between invasive species um, versus weeds, so to speak, versus native plants. And instead of having this pro-native plant, murder all the invasive species, live off of amazon.com, whole foods, uh, modern industrialization, organic kale grown in Mexico. What I'd like to do is propose a model of like, why don't we eat our way out of this problem? Or why don't we eat, craft and create our way out of this problem? So as a network of foragers, the idea would be to have hubs, um, you know, whatever community, sustainable communities, like let's say akin to the Amish without any uh, sort of religious dogmaticism in the approach of how can we link up with certain bioregional uh, herbs. So one of my examples that I've been working with a lot is Artemisia vulgaris or mugwort. Um, so mugwort known as an invader. Uh, 
you know, so I've been across the country and the story of mugwort is profound. Of course, it's a European ancestral plant going back to the earliest days of, you know, Celtic magic and Asia as well. And so it's a familiar smudging plant to our European ancestors. But also when I traveled out to uh, Southern California and shout to uh, Jess Starwood, and we taught some classes out there, we collaborated. Um, all the people in Southern California helped me to realize that Artemisia douglasiana is absolutely a native plant there and is really utilized. And so there's the ethical issue of like, well, what if you're taking it from the native people and like give the land back and native use and sort of cultural appropriation. But oddly enough, Artemisia vulgaris, this invasive species all over the East Coast is completely um, overtaking and rampant, like literally the joke is that the essential oils of mugwort are being, uh, are penetrating people's brains, whether they like it or not, because they mow it. And so they're basically wafting essential oils of mugwort every which way. And that's because obviously our New Jersey is not high in the visionary lucid dreaming uh, perspective. So uh, mugwort is working everyone. So what I've done then is I've thought, what about intervening on the harvest of Artemisia douglasiana with a bioregional approach. Like I'll send you as much as you want. I'll wild harvest it. And so what I did uh, this year with a group of people and constant classes is tend to this orchard that was left alone for probably about eight years. It's a mugwort monoculture with fruit trees. And I just started picking and plucking and weeding and burning and uh, harvested everything I could. I harvested roots. Um, I have a mugwort need, mugwort root need brewing right now. Um, I harvested leaves, I dehydrated them, and I bagged them, and I made them available for sliding scale. So basically, the, the model is it cost me six dollars, and there's my sliding scale option. And for those of you out there who have trouble with the idea of pushing on all these the IRS and the, the, the whole methodologies of trying to get into kitchens and certified and get your products out there is a nightmare. So obviously the loophole, so to speak, is, well, what if it's uh, based on donations, right? So you're donating for the cause. You're not necessarily donating for the product and the product is a free gift. So there's your loophole, but whether that should be a standard, that should be possible. Um, so I've, probably got out about 25 pounds of mugwort, which is nothing in New Jersey, all over the country on um, that sliding scale. And that helped to raise money for the next step, which is this Davis tent. Um, so within this, um, obviously what the big problem is, you know, um, I think it's really important that we understand like this is a class issue. This is not a race issue. This is not a sex gender issue. This is a class issue. So obviously um, Jeff Bezos is not paying taxes, right? So for example, and we are so bound by the, I like to give the story that a grandma who has an apple tree in her backyard, if she wanted to make a couple cases with ball jars of jam and sell it at the market or sell it at the local grocery store, she would have to accrue so much debt in order to make a small batch of jam that it would not be financially worth it for her to actually do that. So the under the table or the illegal method has come out of a, that's what people have been doing for thousands and thousands of years. And so that our ancestral ability to share the surplus is not happening, right? And so with apples, obviously you get jam. With apples, you can also get apple chips. Right. So with mugwort, for example, you can have multiple cottage industry avenues. For example, some people like sewing. Well, there's many ways to sew. There's many things to sew. So imagine a combinatory mugwort harvesters on one side with their Etsy or their cottage industry capacity and so seamstresses on the other side. Now there's a product called a mugwort pillow, mugwort dream pillows with prayerful intention and locally crafted. Um, you know, there's all kinds of manifestations of what can be done. So you take any plants, you know, take mugwort, fermentation leads to, you know, so it's in multiple factors in our culture. It can be made into a tea, it can be made into a tincture, it can be made into a powder, it can be made into a smudge bundle, it can be made into root beer. It can, the roots are medicinal. And interestingly enough, here's where we have a certain, 
right? And so I hear bartering or trading is an option, but even acting first initially as open source capitalist to get eco villages, hubs, certified kitchens, farm stands, farmers market access to have the basic funds to start doing that capitalistic trade. And then saying here, we're doing this class. You can be a mugwort harvester too. Come join the, this, this method that we have going. We're removing invasive species, turning them into cottage industry products, tea tinctures, ferments, beers, meads, you know, dream pillows in the case of mugwort, right? Autumn olive you take is another invasive species, which the park system is after right now. And they're starting to cut and probably put some nasty chemicals on it, which poisons the whole ecosystem. And instead of having autumn olive harvest festivals, you know, and that's like a community building awesome thing, which is, you know, how are we going to have gathering availability and location, uh, uh, you know, access to human connection as we enter this metaversic universe. So the, the, the ability for us to start utilizing invasive species to make cottage industry localized jobs is a window that not a lot of people are thinking about or talking about as I hear. And I'm really glad to kind of share some of these ideas with y'all because um, I think it's really important that this could scale down the right and the left, the political duality to wait a minute. So, you know, the, the biggest problem is cottage food laws. The biggest problem is that a grandma can't bake bread in her local uh, community and sell it at the farmer's market without a, a whole bunch of dang tootin' hoo-ha. So it's like, at what point can we get people galvanized on the fact that small businesses are being destroyed by that kind of stuff? Those are the regulations to go after, not give multinational corporations unregulated ability to frack, et cetera, but give people the ability to actually make locally crafted products. And that starts hitting at multinational corporatism, which is really the problem, the exotic expansion that everybody needs one thing in order to be healthy, whether it's all the coconuts in the world, or it's all the quinoa, or it's all the soy product, like diversification based on local in weeds, right? So we are the garlic mustard harvesting tribe. And out of garlic mustard, you can make garlic mustard chips, garlic mustard roots, uh, horseradish, you can ferment it and turn it into horseradish. You can ferment it, dehydrate it, turn it into wasabi powder. Now you've got your vegan, local, organic, raw, all the little stickers that you see at the store, but it's local. And then it could be like 10% of pro proceeds goes into restoration. As you're harvesting the garlic mustard, there's no longer a problem. The problem is that Amazon is delivering you kale from Mexico instead of us having the ability to put garlic mustard in your face first and foremost. So that gets us into a hunter-gatherer mentality of like, obviously you eat what's in front of you. And that's what puts the ecosystem into balance. Um, not just looking at it and going through it and doing your miles and going away from it. And so the problem is the old hat of herbalists and foragers really have this, I would call, stringent methodology of making sure that not everybody's going in there harvesting ginseng, right? And so this is actually how the laws of the park system are created, right? It's, it's a matter of you can't harvest in certain states, for example, state parks, you're not allowed to harvest garlic mustard because they basically just have a blanket thing against harvesting ginseng or some rare stuff. So I've had conversations, debates, arguments with the park system people. I always find them to be extremely like, don't touch anything. We're allowed to spray it with Roundup as much as we want. Don't pick anything because you're breaking laws. And I'm like, but those laws are against our traditions. Those laws are against homesteading. Those laws are against Daniel Boone. Those laws are against native people. Like this is the human interaction which puts the ecosystem into balance. We have a double destroyed ecosystem, right? First of all, we lost the chestnuts. Second of all, we clear cut everything, every tree that you see almost all across North America. From there, we had cattle grazing, eat all the saplings for years and years and years. So we have a very destroyed forest. It's not the way it should be. Um, but the idea is a cottage industry revolution to bring in those Etsy level uh, craft jobs and get everybody synced up. So then the other idea is basically the van dweller culture or the school bus culture are the UPS delivery systems between these hubs, right? So imagine that autumn olive harvest 
is on the East Coast, a lot of band dwellers are gonna be like, I wanna do the autumn olive harvest. So here's your migrant worker phenomenon. They all migrate, trimigrants, right? So they all migrate to the East Coast. Some people have uh, the ability to interface, you know, in an Airbnb style. You're gonna live in a tent for this long and this is your volunteer program. We have this many guest houses. These are the hubs that if we can create, um, as a community, as a network, as an intuitive uh, people who realize the apocalypse is, is nigh, um, these could be the, the ways that these products can flow through. So say someone's then coming out to do chestnut oil pressing or whatever it may be, or white sage cultivating in California, white sage cultivating, right? Helping to produce the thing. If it is native, right, the ethics would be different. Like you have to give back. You can't just take, but with invasive species right now, if we did actually rely on them, they wouldn't be as prolific as they were. So then you'd be basically managing the garlic mustard patch in the park instead of growing kale somewhere else. Um, and of course we have the fact that vegetables, um, if they equal monocultures, they are not necessarily regenerative, healthy, sustainable, um, and also often exploit and all are causing things like pest increase, are causing things like soil degradation, are causing things like the ecosystem cannot necessarily bounce back from. Um, so monoculturing and from any level, even if it's hemp, is very different than necessarily relying on grow enough. What happened to Apios americana, the ground nut? So my goal with um, working with these plants is, you know, putting in, in this region, putting in pawpaws, putting in tons of leeks, um, and then starting to develop these berms to grow Apios americana or the groundnut, which I would prefer to be my carbohydrate. So obviously then the question is, where is all the Apios americana? Where did all that food go? Um, so you can see obviously indigenous people had a huge hand in producing from their environment, not necessarily shipping or importing Germanic agriculture, not necessarily importing permaculture practice, but cultivating the land as a food resource. So here I have now pawpaws, you know, hazelnut, um, <clears throat> leeks, and groundnuts. And then another interesting note, if anyone uh, knows the uh, plant hog peanut, which is really one of those plants that said that indigenous people ate in large amounts, but when you start looking for it, it seems uh, extremely minuscule. So what I did was I was trimming trail, uh, trim the spice bush, dehydrated, dry the spice bush, utilize that for tea, made tincture, et cetera, et cetera. There's the cottage industry methodology, of even pruning the trails, right? Everything goes into its proper spot. Now the uh, spice bush is like my tea plant, right? Just like Camellia sinensis, green tea, pick on the spice bush, get the buds. Um, so within that, um, oh, where was I going? So spice bush is great too. Oh, so the ground nuts, I actually took branches of spice bush that I had pruned and made trellising for the ground, uh, not ground nuts, uh, hog peanuts. As a result, those hog peanuts had something to climb up and they had, uh, let's say a 30 to 50% yield in beans because they had just a little bit extra light. So that's a food resource that we usually think is nil and worthless. However, I got above ground parts. So obviously in the case of hog peanut, if you dig down you get this little tiny nut at the base and then it's finished, it's dead. Where if you trellis it and you treat it as a legume, which it is, um, then obviously it gets more light. You tend the forest. I cleared multi-floor rows, um, you know, harvested the petals, put it in a tincture trimmed it, burned it, you know, took that soil, um, took that ash, mixed it with compost, put it back around, built beds. Um, then the goal is ginseng, et cetera, continue to bring in these ancestral plants as well as manage the invasive species into cottage industry. So then the pieces are, if everyone has a certified kitchen hub, whatever that means. So in my case, what I've got is a local health food cafe uh, called uh, Get Juice. They have options for a commissary kitchen. So we have the interaction going on as far as getting just enough legitimate certification while we challenge the certification process because sometimes it is absolutely phobic, excessive, and ridiculous. And sometimes it does not 
benefit the best interest of safety and health. It benefits the interests of big big ag and big corporations to keep small businesses down. And that's the message I think people need to share is that this is hurting small businesses. Like, you know, automation and having over-regulation against small businesses on the lower level is very different than uh, deregulating, you know, uh, multinational corporations. So um, then you have all these ideas. Another run of this idea is um, for a while, I was harvesting juniper branches, beech branches, little things, twigs that were on the ground, and I was making um, crochet hooks from them, carving them. So now I would carve, give it to my crochet friends. They are uh, crafting with these crochet hooks. As a result, there's also somebody's going to have sheep, somebody's going to have llamas. Those people have all this wool. They have no idea what to do with it. They often throw it out because there's not a cottage industry of people going, hey, we'll carve this stuff. There's your workshop on carding, right? Now you have a whole community being built to produce things like local garments, local socks. This is the way that people can interact and interface and pull people into these community ideas. So each one of those is uh, an expansion and inversion of a workshop, right? And every time you do a workshop on said thing, you get not only an awareness of who's interested, right? You build community, you also start sharing resources and you also start sharing down from the idea of everything's got to come from Walmart, Target, et cetera, these big box stores. Um, so garlic mustard, you know, plantain, dandelions can be put with salad dressing on top of it and dehydrated in a dehydrator. And there's your raw food chips, lawnmower chips, if you'd like to call them. Um, Green smoothie powders are basically lawn clippings. You know, we've been sold a false bill there. You know, how many, how many, you turn the label around, it's basically just lawn clippings. So basically all we have to do is weed out any poisonous potential plants and then mow the lawn with our lawn mowing scissors. And now you've got green smoothie powder. You've got all kinds of things that are being so internationally scaled up that it's time to kind of take some of that power back. You know, spoons and woodcrafts can be made from sticks that are piled on the street corners. You know, I remember seeing tons and tons of eucalyptus. They hate eucalyptus in California. You go into Whole Foods, eucalyptus essential oil coming from Australia. They're literally leaving piles of eucalyptus on the ground all over California and they hate the tree. And so it's just like, where is the local eucalyptus essential oil uh, a crafting community uh, to deal with the fact that, oh, eucalyptus does have some issues, but it's also something we're importing. And I guarantee you the importation process of that essential oil and what's behind that is a lot worse than just taking the local eucalyptus and turning it into essential oil cooperatives. You know, um, Another thing is bamboo, an invasive species. Now it's like super great to buy your bamboo flooring coming from China and people have bamboo all over the place. So Bamboo and, and hemp, for example, the hemp fiber could be, if there was something like cooperatives where we had the common tools to do some of this stuff to scale down, we could start producing fiber for hempcrete. Um, you know what I mean? You could have hemp bamboo plywood composite. You could definitely make toilet paper out of that. You may even be able to make cellophane out of it. Grass clippings can make biofuel, can make cellophane, can make, you know, toilet paper. We've got all these problems about where we're sourcing this material, right? Um, and so let's see what else we have. Bamboo, I've made bowls, cups, spoons, knives, forks from it. I've done building with it. I've done water movement around. So uh, I made a waddle type of fence out of bamboo, just split it and then threaded it in, out, in, out, in. So that's just in people's backyards and they're like, oh, we have too much of this. You could of course eat the bamboo shoots. It's like you can make fire making tools out of bamboo. There's so many things that can, um, yeah, that's exactly as Angie Parrish says, we need that infrastructure. And so there's something called granges and I don't know what constitutionally um, a grange is entitled to, but granges were farmers cooperatives that used to exist for seed sharing, for this, that, and the other thing. Now granges are basically decrepit into, you know, a couple sewing classes or something, but that might be an access point in where maybe even state funding or whatever could be utilized for uh, local grain production. Local, you know, Curly Dock is an amazing accidental grain source, which is the same as buckwheat. So that's been my grain source. And it's like, the more you harvest it, the more you realize, gosh, I could make this all go away. 
And that's just, then you have the responsibility to manage your system. And with something like Curly Dock, of course, you've got medicinal roots. So you make tincture, you make tea, you've got that berberine containing, you get the liver, gallbladder flush, your blood gets cleansed and you can harvest greens at certain times and you get seeds, you know, lamb's quarters, amaranth, here, here to the, to the weeds. Um, so yeah, then cottage industry access to whoever has a skill, please teach. And then from there, who's interested in doing that skill. And then from there, where's the workshops? From there, how do we do the outreach? How do we sell these things? How do we generate income connection, um, community resources based on and uh, the fact that invasive weeds are here to show us that we've been trying entirely too hard to do industry. And although I think this is a very capitalistic approach, um, there's like uh, somebody asked Ramakrishna, the Indian saint, you know, uh, why, why do you learn these things? And he talked about how you take a thorn to get one of the thorns out. If you have a thorn in your finger, uh, a, 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 let's say a rose thorn, you can actually take another rose thorn to get that one out and then you discard them both. So within this model is like, imagine a QR code that's on your product that says, here's how to harvest your own mug. Here's how to harvest and identify your own mugwort. You're supporting a cause and then you're opening yourself up for a new method of capitalism, which is that this is now an open source model. We're receiving donations to teach this model and it's about land restoration. It's about ethical interaction with the ecosystem. It's about education. It's about taking our power back. And I don't feel like that would be as divisive as a lot of the other potential movements. And of course, everyone interacts with plants, has a daily interaction with plants. Um, so I'll do a little show and tell here. I'm going to show you all some of what's been going down. Here is a, out of everything I've done this year, um, I wonder if I can switch this. Here, I'll do it like this. So here's basically one year of an apothecary here. And um, there's all kinds of different things. Of course, pine needles are in abundance here. But here's an example of an invasive species. So I pulled out Japanese barberry. Of course, this plant is blamed for ticks, uh, overpopulation of ticks, but I've literally spent a lot of time looking for morels under Japanese barberry. And I have not seen, I see a lot of ticks. I've not seen them anywhere more in Japanese barberry than everywhere. Um, but this is, of course, you know, we have golden seal and we have uh, Oregon grape, which have berberine. And this is the problem in a way where we're, we're, we're getting so caught up in studies and research. Does Japanese barberry have the same medicinal chemistry as uh, uh, Oregon grape or golden seal? Not necessarily, but it's generally the same. Berberine containing astringent, you know what I mean? So antimicrobial and astringent, are there different ratios of chemicals? Yes. Do you need a different one cup? What does that equal as an herbalist? Like what, a dropper full or two or three or a two cups of tea instead of one. And this is, of course, an invasive species where golden seal and Oregon grape are being over harvested. And there's the whole issue of ethical interaction. So here's our bioregional option. Nobody wants Japanese barberry. <laughs> you know, nobody's working with it. So I'm pulling it on this property. I've uh, harvested the flowers. I took the, literally, I took a, uh, tweezer to get the flowers off and I made an infused honey of Japanese barberry flowers and it's so unique and it was so tedious so literally the berries for tea the flowers for um, um, infused honeys or tinctures the uh, roots of course are medicinal roots you can make all kinds of things from that so that's just one so-called invasive species which now Literally, all you have to do is throw it in a blender with alcohol and you make medicinal antimicrobials for the whole village. Um, so again, like how do we kind of shift culture to say, hey, why don't we use what's over excessive and then it wouldn't be over excessive instead of be so reliant on like, no, what's what's the sexiest, most exotic herb in the whole world? That's the only way to heal, you know, and like meanwhile, you're waiting and you're waiting. And of course, healing is about seizing the moment, not waiting a week for something to come, not waiting two weeks. Like, oops, I didn't have it. Like, that's why you have an apothecary. So um, the Japanese barberry honey is here. Of course, then I've done a lot with um, mugwort. 
And so here's another fun thing we've made, which is mugwort hydrosol. And of course, this smells incredible. The hydrosol being the soul and the spirit portion of the plant. So a little bit of uh, distillation through alchemy. Um, and that, of course, we bottled up in affiliation with a uh, friend, Sasha Botanica. So that was kind of a collaborative effort. She had the bottles on her table. I had the bottles on my table. There we had two sources for the same product, right? And then a cooperative based on essential oil production out of invasive species also gets a reduction of invasive species. It takes a lot of plants to make essential oils or it makes uh, uh, even hydrosol. And of course that's really great in skin care, but it's also ingestible. The odd thing is, um, so here's, let's see. I mean, mugwort, forest blend, a tea, right? That was available by donation. This is forest blend. It's literally me pruning the trails here, <laughs> pruning back the raspberry and blackberry bushes. So it's mugwort, um, blackberry leaf, raspberry leaf, spice bush, and goldenrod. And basically, this is clearing out the meadow to allow other plants to thrive. And now, here by sliding scale, if anybody wants to help support this sort of methodology as a whole, please help donate. That's the, that's the goal, um, at least for the invasive species. You know, if it's, if it's something different, then maybe there's a different model there. Um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot you can do with invasive species. There's a little bit of mugwort root mead. So of course, a mead is a one to six honey. Um, right, a, lot of, a lot of people right now are not doing herbal meads, they're doing plain mead and mead alone is you know not great but if you take the water and you turn the water into tea first you have a one to six ratio um one part honey six parts water or tea so i boiled the mugwort root and then added one part honey to the six parts water put a balloon in this case and once it stops being expanded, right, it's, it's now unable to gas off. So once it stops being expanded, then it'll go flaccid. From there, you do what's called racking, and then you get your mead, your hard kombuchas, et cetera. Now there's a, a small scale ability to make alcohol from home, to sell it is gonna put you in debt. And this is again, the problem is pushing on these laws and helping people understand that that's where people, you talk about low income issues, you talk about like inequality, you talk about all these kind of things. And it's like so much of it is coming from people not having access to local food production in their backyards and community gardens and things like that, or knowledge of weeds, you know? And so every park all over North America has park systems which are trying to get rid of these weeds. And those could be at farmer's markets, those could be free, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's see if we have any other oh, acorns, of course, in the back, some Amanita muscaria, of course, very important. Let's see, just wanted to make sure I'm still on there. Don't want to lose service. Chantrails from the year. So this is just a little bit of the apothecary and some of the things that have been going on. And then, of course, lots of sprouts, lots of sourdough. Um, Black walnut, another plant which is not utilized. We actually uh, took the hulls off, kicked them off, dehydrated like 20 pounds of black walnut. I've made powder out of black walnut. As a result of that powder, I've made inks for paints. We've also dyed uh, clothing with that. So there's a natural plant dye um, out of black walnut hull. Of course, black walnut hull tincture, very helpful as an antiparasitic. The black walnuts, we actually uh, kept and we uh, cured them. And then we actually have them stored up the hill in a garbage pail, a metal garbage pail that we sunk into the ground, made a rock lined area. It's full of cedar wood chips. So that is a cache for black walnuts. So we probably got about three or four black, uh, three or 400 black walnuts put up and all the hulls dehydrated. So that's another medicinal which of course like deworming for horses, for pigs, for all kinds of animals, dogs, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so I wonder if anyone wants to share any ideas or has any questions based on anything you're sharing. Oh, you know, it's Mark, oh, Mark Williams, what a hero. And uh, yeah, Eric, it, uh, me and Eric Joseph Lewis have spent about five minutes together 
but he's always floating close by. And of course, Mark has changed my life and inspired me in all kinds of ways. And I just appreciate y'all. And uh, if anybody wants to sort of be in touch about any of these ideas, um, you know, let's figure out by regional trade, you know what I mean? And including barter for us, but then like, you know, um, the big bane of eco villages is that they never set up a model. You know, they never set up a regenerative economic model necessarily. Um, so at least that's what I've seen. So the idea of invasive weed harvesting being how we get connected to local community and do commerce and then educate people about these things is like, I feel like it's undeniable. It's so much more heart centered and so much more clear and so much more direct than, you know, fighting right, left and politics and all this stuff. So. Yeah, so Dan, I, I have a, a question here. I'm wondering um, as far as the, you know, making these uh, cottage industry co-ops and everything, um, you mentioned, you know, the Grange maybe being a starting point um, what other actionable steps could people in the audience take if, you know, they, they so imagine they got the skills, they, they, you know, they know what they're doing, but they want to create those co-ops. What actionable steps could they do to, um, you know, start to get something like that going? Cool. I'm glad you asked. Um, so what I have, I'm not sure I have it all over my social media somewhere or other, but it's basically a, a progression of principles math, which is basically the progressive stages for cottage industry revolution, um, which I don't have on hand, but here we go. Um, it would take a second to find it. And then the first step is who's got the space for some sort of community activity? Do you have a barn? Do you have a living room? Do you have a yoga center? If you want to host, then who's going to fill it with what? you know, whether it's movie nights, whether it's potlucks, right? Sustainable potlucks, BYOB, bring your own bowls, utensils. Um, these are some of the things I'm doing here, right? Instead of it being unconscious and everybody brings saran wrap and paper plates and tin foils, everything. Like, hey, rainbow family style, can you bring your own bowl that's washable? And then we of course have a stream. So it's like, yeah, you wash your bowl in the stream. And now we're educating people on like an alternative way of getting food into their bodies. That's not all full of the excesses of the material waste. Um, so within that, it's just what community niches can be filled and everybody's gonna have a different avenue in, but even if it's a barn, a living room, a house to hang out in, movie nights are a great way, you know, have a documentary or movie and then have a discussion after that, have potlucks, or if you have a skill out there and you have space, share it. Foraging workshops, obviously, foraging and herbalism classes, fermentation acorn processing you know i've been doing everything i've been trying to do it's really interesting because i'm trying to sync classes up with seasonal homesteading needs right so i had a venison class based on we got a deer and so then it was like okay now i have a frozen hide so when are we going to do it's going to thaw out enough to get this hide going and whoever wants to come is going to work on hide tanning and so it's like when the mugwort's popping who's going to come and make smudge bundles um, try to turn those all into workshops. And then it's like, steal this model. If you want to continue to make mugwort smudge bundles, like, hallelujah, you're, rem you're removing an invader. Of course, the greatest invader is, uh, I would say, multinational corporate capitalism. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome way to get in get the community involved. And that's something that, you know, we all just want to stay in our own little bubbles um, and just order off of Amazon when, you know, we're, we're really missing that vital connection between two people um, or community, you know? Yeah. The revolution will not be televised. And uh, it's really about face-to-face -face human interaction and, uh, the more that's taken away from people, the more they're going to crave it, and the more they're going to want to sit around a fire and start hashing these things out, these political divisionary things in person. It's just like, it's never going to happen on social media in the sense that the people are too heated when they're behind screens. And I've seen a lot of huge conversations happening in front of my face that with a little bit of attention and awareness has like let off the pressure valve a lot. So that's what, you know, like, my joke is to start a political party called the Forest Party. And the one rule is that we just make a fire 
And then like, ideally, like everybody throws down on rainbow gathering, you know, build the hobo villages um, and of course bring the best of what you can and learn, right? Drum circle and talk about the shit that needs to be talked about. So any form of that is to me like the guy in message from the earth, like get the people together into the villages again. And, you know, social tribalism is just a uh, distorted form of the desire to come back and return to this tribal way of existence because we feel like anything other than that now, the hyper-rationalist approach to culture is leading us to like being uh, destroyed by our own making of AI bots or something. So people are starting to feel this biological feeling again and it's about feeding that and, and meeting that and saying, here's an option, dig. You ever dig potatoes? People are like, hell no, I've never dug potatoes. And then when they have their hands in the soil, it's just more transformative than arguing on social media and stuff, you know? Yeah, 100%, man. Thank you for that message. It's always super inspiring to listen to you. Cheers. Um, got a couple of questions on the more practical side of um, just sort of herbal medicine. Um, one person was asking earlier if we we're going to have someone presenting talking about the uh, how to incorporate oxalates into your diet in a safe way, because a lot of wild plants, of course, have oxalates. And, um, you know, I responded to her that, you know, they can be broken down very easily by heat. And then she said, well, in terms of tincturing things with high oxalates, um, how do you address that? And I was like, Dan will probably be the perfect person to address that. So um, any thoughts on that that you could share with us? Well, you know, the first step would be is are oxalates uh, alcohol soluble? And I'm not right. sure, like, how, how do they pull into that menstruum? Um, so that I'm not sure. Like, so people have been doing curly dock root for years and years and years and years. Um, I also think that the interesting thing about whole plant medicine versus isolated extracts, when you think about a chemical like calcium oxalate, you also think about there's fiber in the plant, right? So when you have the fiber, Obviously the fiber dilutes the ability for oxalates to build up in the system. There are all these compounds within that balance things out. So the more isolated you get, the more hyper uh, sort of out of touch it becomes, right? Because like if you take a dang curly dock root and you start noshing on it, you're not gonna have any uh, calcium oxalate problems because a whole bunch of factors in your body are gonna say, damn, that's a lot of medicine. And so when you're extracting and isolating and extracting, the further you do that, the less you have the physiological ability to keep things in check by other things, like for example, your taste buds. Um, so that actually means it's a stronger medicine to just nibble a tiny piece of curly dock than it is to necessarily go through this grandiose process with it. Um, that said, um, I think that with I don't know about tincture. Obviously, fermentation also can break down oxalates in different ways. Like you said, heating. Another factor is mastication. Yes, I said mastication, which means just uh, crushing it up, <coughs> uh, massaging it, as they call it, and that letting it sit for uh, 10, 15 minutes, even with some apple cider vinegar, seems to reduce the oxalates. Um, obviously, I talked to Pascal about this. He's the only one, Pascal Bodar, he's the only one I know that said that he got um, um, uh, stones from it, you know, and it's like the two factors, he said his, his parents had a history of stones and he was really overdoing it with older plants. And so I think also understanding the <coughs> timing, right? So with curly dock, the leaves, they are edible. They have oxalates, excuse me. Got to go dose. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I'll just add to that while you're while you're stepping away for a second. I talked to Pascal as well. At one point, I got to take one of his classes, and he was he was talking about getting the uh, the kidney stones from taking too many too many greens in. And he also said that he was on a year of all forage <laughs> food diet pretty much at that point. So I think he that's relied, a, relying heavy on curly dock, which has lots of calcium oxalate. Right. So <laughs> then you have excuse me <clears throat> the young greens are a lot less full of it than the older greens. And you actually can taste the difference. It goes from sour to bitter. Mm -hmm. So when the stock is present, it's a time that the plant is saying, don't eat as many greens. I'm going into seed production, wait till I have seeds. And so following the seasonal cycle also determines a lot. Now you can see it less in California than you can in New Jersey. Um, 
the seasonal cycle, right? The winter is the time the fall, the roots fall to spring because the energy is there, right? And as it's growing, that calcium oxalate is uh, transforming and doing things. <coughs> That's where the appropriate time, place, circumstance, and dose. I think we're also falling prey to now these hyper-rationalist herbalists who have now chemical analysis factories um, and, you know, the, the pyrolizidine alkaloids with, with comfrey and stuff, it just gets to the point where we're losing the fact that if you engage in as whole of a plant as possible, you're going to learn first about it. And so the easiest recommendation is like, if you take a piece of curly dock in your body and your whole body goes, no, 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 listen to that. And then analyze how much of that is your psychological resistance versus how much of that is your body saying, this is not my medicine. And it takes time to sit with that. And so I just think that's where like, we're not, we're, we're so into the head and we're so into like, oh, let me, let me understand the chemical analysis. And we're not really actually seeing how it feels to take it. So, you know, that's me with a cough right now, taking elderberry. I'm doing a trial on myself. I'm studying the phenomenon and the results. And I don't feel like people are doing their due diligence there. You know, the, oh yeah, overprescribe ashwagandha. You know what I mean? But not like get to know the texture of the person, the lung texture, the lung texture of the plant. When you nibble it, what does it actually do to your mouth? What does it actually do to your body? Check in 10 minutes later. Um, so for a little anecdote real quick, I actually took 0.4 um, <clears throat> of Amanita muscaria. I poured hot water over it. It was dehydrated. And I did a meditation yesterday on just the microest microdose of Amanita muscaria just kind of tune into it. No, I didn't take 25 grams. I didn't, you know, I've, I've taken it one other time at a small dose. And so my trial starts with a very small dose getting to know that space. And I just think if you treat any plant like that, you're gonna learn more about it with that process, with that methodology than you will in any book or anything like that. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing on that. And uh, thanks for all those awesome, awesome thoughts and resources. Um, had another question uh, from Maggie and Maggie's asking, other than mugwort, what herbals do you like for mead making? And Mark shared a, a great resource that I think he wrote up for some other herbs as well. So y'all can check that out in the chat, but uh, curious what you like. Um, this year, I actually, it's really amazing that Mark is here because I <clears throat> once went down, basically led by Frank Cook's spirit to North Carolina to meet all of, ended up coincidentally meeting all of his friends and was at a meat circle and I was vegan at the time and I went to uh, Ken Krause's uh, Green Path Gathering and Mark and many magical people were there and they had a meat circle and I'm like wow this is amazing I don't drink alcohol I'm like so anti-alcohol culture here I am vegan somebody passed around a cicada shell need and instantly I was like oh that makes sense hair and nails all the minerals and it changed my trajectory and of course the way they did a mead circle was with prayer and intent in the in the way of honoring every plant that went in it where it went etc cetera, etc cetera. so this year i was traveling i ended up sleeping at a little spot <clears throat> in my van and woke up and i didn't realize i was in the heart of the cicada hum um, in Princeton, New Jersey, it was so profound. I couldn't leave. It was the most, I forgot it was even happening. So I went there and like had this whole experience and collected the shell and I made mulberry uh, cicada shell and mulberry mead this year. And it's been absolutely fabulous. And of course, fermentation breaks down the, the shell and the shell actually has tons of zinc in it, all kinds of interesting things. And uh, of course, I didn't, I would have never known that. I, I would have never had that in my so I've preserved the tradition, thanks to uh, all those folks out there, cicada shell, I don't even know who had it. Um, so then I also did a lot of uh, <clears throat> wineberry mead this year, um, mugwort mead, because I like mugwort is the mug wort, a wort is a uh, plant for primary fermentation, that's what it's called, and then mug is a cup. So mugwort has uh, definitely a history of mugwort beer. Um, but, you know, anything, any tea that you can make, you could turn into a mead, you know.
great. So cicadas are one of the best uh, best ingredients for me in conclusion there. And that's awesome. Um, <laughs> and quite an abundance of them, <laughs> especially this past year. Um, cool. So if anyone has any other questions, now's a good time to ask. Um, we'll be taking them out of the chat and relaying them to Dan. And is there any way that people can, um, what's the best way for people to stay in touch with you? I posted your website earlier, return to nature.us, believe it is into the chat. So people have that. Um, as far as your Instagram, do you want people to go to the return to nature one or return to nature 2.0 or what's your preference? We'll see what happens. I mean, definitely okay. censorship is real. And so I've got, that's my primary source of communication is through the return to nature page on Instagram. Um, email always works too and uh websites i don't know it's like they're so half dead i just don't even i'm really trying to refine my use of social media you know i wish i was coming to the firefly gathering i don't even know what's going on with the world what's like it's so unstable out there i was just like i'm trying to hide out for a while and just like let things go through this process so i'm up in the mountains in northwestern new jersey um, actually really close to uh, Jess, Jessica, who used to uh, be a student of Frank's. And so just kind of hiding out in the woods and learning the woods life. I've, I've made it a goal that like leaving this property that I'm on means on foot. And so I've done a lot of like on foot journeying instead of like all over the place. So I'll buy big amounts of supplies and then I'll just hide out here. And I've been doing some bow hunting and shotgun hunting and then just living with the, the winter, it's it's been a nice break because I would travel all over the place for, you know, five years. I've been traveling across the country, meeting all those amazing folks. And now it's time to like hide out and become an old grumpy herbal curmudgeon. <laughs> yeah, I totally, I totally feel that sentiment. I think you know taking the energy and the time and the the resources it takes to leave a place is, is really it's so taxing it's so taxing on ourselves and the community and so yeah for me as well it's just like if I'm going to go to something that's very intentional at this point there's maybe one or two places per year I'm going to really travel to and some of these gatherings are the things that that feel really right for me right now so everyone's asking if you're coming to these to Firefly or um to Piedmont or skills and it sounds like you're just oh. hunkering down for now I mean I, I don't even like it's so hard for me to predict what April May June July August like I just now we're gonna have climate something it's gonna be climate apocalypse this this uh glacier thing is it's it's a very good way to sell preemptive fear so you know, whether it's happening and it's also just like, I, it's hard to imagine a world where the locking, the this on off switching stops. So I'm just like, it's hard to plan for what am I gonna do in two, a year? I don't know how people are planning like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, come Luke, come on up. You know, uh, that's really my preference is in-person interaction, in-person classes. So I do all kinds of like, kids come over adults come over we have individual times together and i'm just really trying to open that up to like if if you learn something please feel free to donate and then just like let me know before you come obviously and then what kind of skills you want to learn and work on and so it's been really fun to push that sort of improvisational aspect of educating and that's what i want to do i just want to have a davis tent and like have people sign up to come by and then when there's a group it's a group when there's one person it's one person we're always getting stuff done or like working on homesteading skills and you know, doing a lot of natural building here, putting up, you know, primitive infrastructure, getting really interested in natural building, you know, so a lot of that's coming on, coming along, and uh, I'm really excited for the spring here, so if y'all are ever in, in the neighborhood or want to come by, let me know, tent, tent space is available. <laughs> <laughs> right, I'm sure a lot of people Let me know, that. as I said. <laughs> <laughs> Don't just show up. <laughs> Yeah. So is there a good place for people if they want to donate to your projects and to, um, you know, receive some, some mugwort or whatever awesome herbs you have available for people? Is that mainly through your, through your Instagram? You want people to get in touch with you about that? Or is there a shop or anything? Or Well, Instagram, my website, um, uh, since it's all small batches, it's really hard to keep up with my website as far as like some of the stuff I'm doing is just like six bags of tea. So it's like, usually I just filter that through Instagram. 
Um, so that's pretty much mostly the way things go. But my Instagram is being like slowly, like I can't even do Instagram lives anymore. Um, I got that feature taken away and then given back. And now it's just like seems to cut out and people just hear like static. And so it's just like, okay, what's next? And, you know, as, as far as small businesses, like that was a huge way that I was sustaining my life is through sales, through Instagram. And now a lot of that's changing and uh, their taxation is the IRS is changing the, the uh, laws with that. So then I'm just like, you know what, I was a monk anyway, and I'm just trying to do service. And like, if you want to donate for it, I never cared about any of that. I'm just trying to serve people and, and bring this medicine to folks. And hopefully that could create a sliding scale version. So if anyone wants to donate to continue any work, like there's, I have a PayPal and a Venmo is Return to Nature, and then be a part of it in any way you can and build it in your own community. And if we all just do that, <clears throat> that's the green revolution. <laughs> thanks for sharing all that man and uh yeah i'm sure people out there really want to support you i know i do and uh hopefully that message just gets out to more people and we build more resilience in these systems yeah so we're not totally relying on instagram to sell things and yeah that's yeah. that's the move for sure right. um well wrapping up we got just a couple of more minutes um curious if there's anything else you wanted to share or I mean, I was curious a little bit about um, some of the kids programs you do and kind of how you network with people around doing that. So if you wanted to um, share a little bit about that, you could. Well, you know, it turns out that in a place like New Jersey, if uh, homeschool parents are looking for a sort of outdoor education activity, there's few and far between. And a lot of them are sort of uh, conceptual and not like ax swinging type of community. And so I've gotten kids using a lot of tools, et cetera, here, and it just spread through homeschool community. Um, so there's already a big network here and they're always looking for activities. So obviously being a nature educator for kids is, has been really fun. I don't, it's, I don't let them drop, like the parents are part of it. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of almost just kind of steering the wheel a little bit and then giving them a task set and then just watching very carefully and then from there, I observe who seems to have like particular skill or interest. So like last time, one kid was absolutely obsessed with chopping the wood. So obviously, if we were adults, we'd be like, oh, that person's going to be chopping the wood. So I gave him special instruction as the other kids were doing other tasks, which were less unsafe. And I obviously watched him. So then a couple other kids wanted to watch him learn that. And so that's the wood carving tribe. And so I'm really trying to do it based on like, bring out your natural inclination kids. So a lot of times parents are like, what is your, what are you going to be doing? And I'm like, I'm going to be looking your kid in the eye and asking them what they'd like to do today. And we're going to start from there. And so that's been kind of a really fun and radical way of engaging them as if they are sentient and self uh, autonomous as to, okay, here's some options. What do you want to explore today? So they love doing archery we shot longbow, like every kids of every age, I'll just hold it like differently for different ages. Um, and then they come, it was every Wednesday for a while, but now the whole parking lot snowed in. So I'll be starting that, you know, soon enough. And then every Wednesday kids class. And from there, I'm also going to be doing different, like uh, what I would consider commitment classes. So now it's a huge range from infants to 10 year olds. And then it's like some of those kids are going to be more attentive to wood carving. And so then I'll do like a commitment class on wood carving and like carve your own spoon or carve your own something or other. Um, <clears throat> and then some of them want to do hunting. And so then starting them hunting means, can you sit behind this bamboo blind that we built with a bird's nest right next to you? And can you put your hand out there and can you start letting the bird come to you <clears throat> and nibble some, some sunflower seeds or curly dock seeds? Because if you can't, you don't need your machine gun Rambo. You know, because like that's how a six year old is. So really just kind of scaling them into what, how can we, how can I be of service to try to share that experience with them in exposing them to that? This is serious. This is consequential. This is sacred. You have to utilize all the animal. It's gross. There's guts. You know, I want to put that in kids faces. I want to break the illusion that it's just like supermarket shrink wrapped. Um, so, you know, just all kinds of curriculum based on what do kids want to really do? You know, make mud pies, which is flatbread on a fire, right? That's the ancestral connection to wanting to make flatbread that your gr grandma would have been like, oh, the, look, the three-year-old's ready to work with the fire and make flatbread. So now kids make mud pie, 
because we have a culture that just gives kids mud instead of acorn flour, all right? Because we get bisquick from the store. Um, shelter building, every kid wants to make shelter. And a lot of kids want to make tea in the form of like worms and this and that. And grandma would be like, hey, it's not worms. Try this lemon balm. And they would become an herbalist by four years old. <clears throat> so just following those basic primal instincts and allowing them to express themselves. Incredible. Thanks for sharing about that. Um, yeah, people are lighting up the chat with thank yous. And um, yeah, it's been really a pleasure to meet you and and just get to talk a little bit more and, and, and hear your story and hear what you're doing. Cause it's, it's super inspiring, man. I can tell you're super active and just taking action yeah, like crazy. Got to, you know, uh, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. That's it. And then, uh, the, al the alchemical thing or aura et labora or or et labora, which means pray and work. So, you know, like people are like sending thoughts and prayers and then they're like, prayers are not enough. And so the alchemist said, yeah, yeah, exactly. Prayer and work, you know? Um, so it's just like go time to either sink or swim, like planetarily, you know, this is getting to the point where something is going to give and we're not going to like what gives no matter which direction it goes. And so uh, to those who build a new culture, even if it's just for them and 10, them and 10 other people, it's better to be, you know, on a life raft than just falling off the Titanic. And that's pretty much, I think everybody agrees that something is amiss and uh, stability and sustainability seem very far away from the trajectory that people like Elon Musk, et cetera, are trying to go. And so then it's like, how do we preserve the biological and not just become genetically modified hybrid, you know, soil and green eaters. And it has to do with return to nature, yes, get sir. connected to the earth. Remember the earth is alive and like squirrels are doing something and birds are actually doing something. It's not like they're just sitting there for, you know, they're not machines. So God bless y'all. Thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you, man. Super, super good to hear from you. And thanks for sharing everything. Um, you guys can find Dan's content. I posted his website and his Instagram uh, into the chat. So y'all can find him there, uh, network more with him and we're getting ready for another speaker um hang out with us uh, love having the speakers hang out and listen we got a really great lineup coming up um i've had such an awesome just list of people just willing to to do this for free out of the goodness of their heart so um it's really incredible it's really inspiring for me for sure and hopefully for all of you too i trust um yeah, we've got Jess Starwood up next. She said she's having a couple of Wi-Fi issues, and I think it's all going to be on good timing, but uh, she should be on in just a moment. And in the meantime, we have a couple of sponsors that we need to shout out to. Um, so this will be a really good time to do that. Good time for a bathroom break as well, uh, if anyone needs that. Uh, um, thanks for being with us. And our sponsor today is a uh, a really good friend of mine from the Bay Area, her name is Jess Davis, and um, she's of the Numinous Experience. Um, she's offering holistic coaching and psychedelic integration for those navigating challenging circumstances or wish to gain deeper insights into their lives. Her background as a therapist for individuals and couples colors her work, which is trauma-informed, mindfulness-based, and infuses play and creativity. Jess offers a grounded approach to spirituality where she delights in the work of co-creation and evolution for deeper connection to yourself, to others, and the ecosystems of your life. You guys can learn more about Jess at the, the numinousexperience.com, or you can contact Jess at Jess at the numinousexperience.com. And I'll post those into the chat here in just a moment if y'all want to connect with her. Um, she's offering online sessions for a variety of life issues life transitions and just ways of sort of up leveling yourself um so definitely check her out highly recommended she's a very just empathic sweet kind trained and skilled professional too so um, i'll drop that into the chat so everyone can check out her website and also really appreciating once again thank you for doing that kyle um kyle just put that into the chat for y'all thank y'all for chatting back and forth and and just keeping it alive in there as far as just talking to each other and sharing knowledge. That's what this is really about. We're wanting to bring people together. The magic that happens when we're in that space is palpable. So we want to make sure y'all are, are networking and meeting people in your area and beyond and uh, networking both you know, virtually and, and maybe even meeting in person at some point. Crazy thing. Funny story. Me and Kyle have 
actually never met in person, but we have spent countless hours at this point doing workshops together, um, planning this event together, just talking about foraging, talking about Kyle's ebook, which he has coming out in the next um, couple of weeks to a couple of months, it looks like. So um, yeah, it's just it's just the, the kind of networking that can happen. I mean, even in the digital space where, you know, things are not as, it's not as organic, of course, but there's amazing connections that can be made, point being. All right, so it looks like we got Jess on now. And we'll get her going in just a moment. If you guys don't know about Jess Starwood, suggest you check her out. She has um, quite a presence around um, foraging mushrooms and other plants as well. And um, yeah, she's really a force in the foraging world. Um, she just came out with a book. And um, so here's her bio. Jess, is a, Jess Starwood is a forager chef and herbalist with a master's of science degree in herbal medicine from the American College of Healthcare Sciences. She regularly teaches wild food and herbalism classes in the greater Los Angeles area for adults and children and is the founder of The Wild Path, an immersive wild food apprenticeship course. She is the author and photographer of her first book, Mushroom Wonderland, a forager's guide to finding, identifying, and using 25 wild fungi from Countryman Press. And you can find Jess Starwood's website and Instagram in the chat where I'm about to post it. And Jess, are you, uh, you with us? I am. Good morning. Or, well, it's morning here. Um, good afternoon to you on the East Coast. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so great to have you. Um, yeah, appreciate you being willing to do this. And yeah, we got people from all over the world and all kind of time zones. We had someone from on earlier and um, her screen was flipped upside down because she was on the other side of the world for a while. It was it was wild. Funny how that happens. But uh, it happens. But yeah, so you have a you have a presentation for us today on mushrooms or. Um, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll talk a, a bit about mushrooms and and answer any questions anyone has and um, yeah, kind of open up a discussion on mushroom foraging um you know in current times cool well we'll let you um you know do your presentation points and uh, me and kyle will watch the chat for questions for you and and direct them to you as we go sound good that sounds great yeah thank you very much All right, so good morning. I, like I said, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're at. Um, my name is Jess Starwood and um, I've been foraging for some time now and mushrooms really kind of took over my uh, focus on what I, I enjoy finding out in the woods. Um, I came into foraging from a food and cooking background. Um, I was very much into discovering, um, you know, what is the most real and natural way to eat. Um, you know, we get so uh, confused in our food selections these days with, with what we can only find at the store. So I thought, I'd, you know, you had quite a curiosity on how to look at food in a different way and you know where where else we can look for food besides the supermarket um so that's that's me laying in a a little bunch of amanita muscaria mushrooms uh one of my favorites and um yeah, it sounds like you already have had my introduction, um, but I am just absolutely um, passionate about the natural world and how we uh, connect with it through food and our experiences and, and um, you know, our own personal journeys too. I, I notice um, foraging kind of comes to folks through how 
you know, we relate to the world. Sometimes we're rediscovering the outside world um, and nature, you know, maybe sometimes for the first time and other times from maybe it's a rekindling from our experiences of childhood, um, you know, where those walks in the woods kind of bring us back to ourselves. And, you know, we all have our own personal journeys, how we got there. I do have mine, um, but, you know, it's, it's a fascinating and fun way to, um, you know, like I said, reconnect to the world. So through all of this, I've, you know, um, I wrote a book recently on mushrooms and how to, how to identify and, and use them and forage and cook with them. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but um, we'll, um, whoops, just kind of get into, you know, connecting to, uh, let's see, uh, connecting to, you know, our, our world around us uh, through, our, through our food choices. Um, I also, you know, find that foraging and being out in the wild uh, is quite interesting and as a creative and um, let's see photographic uh, exploration as well. I, I do have an art degree, so I am always running around the woods with my camera and photographing and taking notice, you know, noticing the small things, noticing um, all of the the details, which in a way is actually also a very important part of being a really successful forager. You know, we um, walk through the woods uh, with such a different height. Our senses are so much more heightened. Our awareness is so much more in tune with our surroundings. And, you know, you don't quite get that when you're walking through Trader Joe's or or the supermarket, you know, we're we're being kind of told what we need, what we need, we think we need, and what we are supposed to have. But you know, when we're out in the wild, it's a lot different experience. Where, you know, we, if you want to find mushrooms, you know, you are really having to um, pay attention, pay attention to the the time of year, the different plants that associate with the mushrooms you're looking for, the different uh, microclimates, and you know, you'll be a lot more successful. And it takes years, it takes years of foraging to, uh, to hone those skills uh, and, you know, coming back time after time again and, and really getting to, to know your, the land you're working with. Um, but yeah, it's just such a, it's almost in a way a practice, a spiritual practice, um, going out for a mushroom hunt, going out, you know, foraging, um, becoming inspired by your surroundings. Um, I'm quite, I like to think I'm a little bit creative in the kitchen when it comes to wild foods, um, and you really getting a chance to do new things with um, ingredients that aren't commonly found in, um, you know, in the supermarket or even the farmer's market. You know, you still see a lot of the same, the same fruits and vegetables and, um, but, you know, when you're out in the woods, it's opens up a whole new um, wonderland of of food options and flavors and experiences and tastes, you know, of course, going into it with a um, with knowledge, knowing what you can and can't eat as well. Um, yeah, just here's just a few more pictures here of um, what, uh, you know, just finding the details, finding the interesting things out there. Um, but here is uh, if you know, uh, here's some dishes that I've, I've worked with, um, you know, using all wild and foraged ingredients, um, thinking about things differently, um, getting inspired by colors and forms and uh, textures and, you know, absolutely 
utilizing flavors in, in a you know new flavors in different ways um, exploring the the depths of of each of those um, but yeah one of my favorites here was um, the one here on the, the top right is uh, this was just one of those weird ideas I had walking through the wild um, in near my home and there's a plant called wild cucumber which you know technically it's not ed edible but it does have this very unique and interesting uh, seed pod on it which you see it's very spiky very unusual and just before like maybe a week before i had had um some uni some sea urchin presented in a you know an urchin shell um at a really high-end michelin starred restaurant and i was like how could i think about that differently how could i um make you know because i do do a plant-based cuisine for the most part i because I'm, I'm not a very good fisherman and i'm not a very good hunter so i stick with um with plants so i, I thought it, it, it was a great um creative challenge to uh take this and and turn it into a sea urchin of the land um uh i suppose <laughs> it uh it is a fermented lobster mushroom. So it was also, you know, kind of going on to the underwater sort of theme here with a nettle, um, nettle sauce. And then um, the seeds on top are not caviar or, or any other sort of eggs, but it was a, a pickled mustard seeds. So a little bit of watercress. So, you know, coming at it with a creative mind and, and you know, developing creative dishes using ingredients like i said people don't normally use um it's such it's so much fun it really gets my creativeness going um and yeah there's just so many possibilities out there that i'm i'm seeing some people there's some people out there who are you know getting getting creative and pushing boundaries and um doing things with ingredients i've i'm very surprised to see that they're doing but um you know, pushing past that, those nettle pesto recipes and getting into new territories, um, it's exciting to see. Um, but like here on this other dish, um, on the left here is, I found these ginormous miner's lettuce, um, which is the the shell or the, the part that's holding the the pasta here which the pasta is made from chanterelles um so it's just pure mushroom uh pasta pasta you know um with a uh a wild greens sauce and and then a uh, seared uh candy cap uh southern candy cap mushroom which in my area it's not too it doesn't have quite that maple aroma but it's that was very tasty little just a little bite-sized dish you know and um having fun with it and then even even the basics can be fun too um the uh on the the last dish here is showing some maitake mushroom jerky and you know working with different flavors different um all different uh spices you know with wild foods the spice category just explodes. You have so many different flavors. You can, um, you know, you don't have to make an entire meal out of fi uh, wild foods, but you can take your your everyday types of foods, your favorites, and then starting to infuse those um, wild foods into um, into that through spices, through you know, just adding a little here and there when you can um yeah so the process of of coming up with different things like this uh it's so much fun um i just have some more photos to share with you guys um my travels you know from my book have taken me all across the country and getting to see and forage for mushrooms in so many different regions 
um, you know, with the last couple of years to go internationally has been a little challenging, but so I've, I've kept it, you know, just to the United States, but um, tra traveling all over and getting the taste of different, different regions, different areas um, has been just absolutely eye-opening. And um, let's see, yeah, like just getting to experience mushroom season in, in every part of the year in different areas, um, you know, with my camera in tow was, was a, a fantastic adventure. And there's stories that go along with every single one, every single um, adventure brought me to, you know, different people and different, you know, communities and, um, you know, as much as mushroom hunters are secretive and like to keep their own spots, it was, I was pretty amazed at how welcoming and um, inviting, you know, the community is in different areas, you know, all across, all across the country. It was like, hey, I don't know you, but I'm writing a book um, and I need to photograph some mushrooms and people would be like, hey, I'll take you to my best spot. I'm like, it, it blew my mind, you know, so I, I find that community is super important with foraging and um and, and the community that it has built like even just this you know this summit here what you guys have put together you know it's bringing together so many people with different backgrounds um you know with food and in a big way but then looking back into the community as a um you know, at home in your neighborhood, in your local area. And I've been seeing it more and more, you know, people are working together, they're trading different foraged goods and, you know, hey, I've got, you know, when, when I end up with too many puffballs, there's, I definitely am gonna have to gift them to somebody else. It's nice to trade, it's nice to, um, um, you know, share the wealth and, and that's you know where food really came from in our culture um and then it, it went the wrong direction um let's see let's look here some more more fun photos of wonderful beautiful mushrooms and um yeah with mushrooms like you really you get so much from them that you they really no matter just about whatever you're into, there's some way to involve mushrooms, it seems like. Um, you know, whether you like eating them, whether you like just finding them, there's plenty of people I know who are really interested in just f the thrill of the hunt, just finding them um, and not necessarily really caring for their taste or flavors. Um, but, you know, it's, it's that thrill of the hunt that gets most of us, you know, and then there's also people who are interested in the more artistic side of things, um, fiber arts, um, you know, they, there's a lot of, uh, you can dye with them using their colors, which I haven't really gotten much into, but it is also very fascinating. Um, you can get such an array, or an array of different colors with them. But anyway, culinary mushrooms, yeah. Um, it's pretty fun to, you know, these things you see in high-end restaurants that cost so much money um, and then turning around like, hey, I can just go find those in the woods. Like literally yesterday, I just went truffle hunting for the first time uh, up in Oregon here, which I'm in my van. So I apologize for my, my background here. Um, but yeah, I just went truffle hunting for the first time through some connections of a friend of a friend and um it's amazing like here's this thing that's worth so much money in you know the um restaurant industry but then here i am just digging it out of the ground um amazing just always always in awe of of all the things we have in in nature available to us um yeah the colors and just the beauty of our world around us 
Um, yeah, more food, more food. You know, that's really where I, my specialty really is in the food and food photography. Um, mushrooms, mushrooms are a challenge to photograph, to cook and uh, photograph, you know. Um, they are not always colorful. They're not always have a great shape or texture. Um, so bringing in other elements um, helps to uh, make that work. Hey Jess. Yes. You're um, you're sounding great. Everything's looking great. I'm wondering if you could hit the play button at the top of your slideshow and it will full screen it for us. Um, um, okay. <clears throat> the only when I do that. Um, I do seem to. Okay, well, let's give it a shot. You can try it. If not, it looks fine. It looks great like this as well. I just thought people could really. Um, okay. There we go. Is that because I've done that before and I've had technical difficulties where it takes uh, away all my controls, but that looks like we're doing okay. Looks better to you? It's actually the same on our end. Interesting. Yeah, I don't see the change. Um, Any, we could we can move forward. I didn't want to interrupt you, but um, I mean, it, look, it looks really great like this as well. Okay. All right. I'll just say keep um, going. Okay. We're just going to go with it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not much of a technical person. I'm surprised I can get through Instagram and Photoshop, but um, when it comes to stuff like this, you know, it's, um, yeah, that's okay. We'll get there. No, looks we all great. have our special. <laughs> Anyways, um, so with the, these photos here, you know, just from my my Instagram, um, some different dishes. The one on the left uh, is a chicken of the woods piccata. Uh, so tasty, so tasty. Um, you know, so many things you can do with with mushrooms. They're so versatile. They're so, you know, you have so many different ones to work with. And you can really work with their, yeah. Obviously, with or not obviously for you know for folks who are just getting into it, um, chicken of the woods is quite a meaty mushroom. It you know, just can easily take place of a um, you know any sort of meat dish, um, not any sort, but many meat dishes. That one was spectacular. Um, the one on top here um, is yeah all the spring goodness. That one was so much fun. Um, it was a morel. Uh, it's kind of actually, yeah, there, the concept behind this one was, um, you know, all the forest fires in uh, California. And here we have some burn morels on top of a, an acorn cheese that is um, on top is dusted with charcoal. Um, and then, you know, set on top of a charred uh, oak bark platter. And then, you know, you have all the this spring new the new growth the new growth from the spring greens um pea tendrils and and then the fried um oak leaves the baby oak leaves i fried them and while they do have a bit of tannins in them um they're small let's see if you can see my um let's see right there yeah it's very very tiny black oak leaves just a little new growth and then a um i believe that's a a small maple leaf as well. Um, yeah, just creative. You can get into some different concepts and ideas. And then this is my very famous chanterelle um, mushroom soup. I just served this last weekend for about 40 people. Uh, the recipe of that is actually in my book. Um, super tasty, always getting rave reviews on that one. Right, let's see. Oh no, see, yeah, I lost my, um, oh, there it goes. Hopefully it doesn't just, okay, we're good. Um, yeah, a couple more dishes here. Again, uh, on the left, using Amanita muscaria, which I got quite a bit of feedback on this one of like, oh my gosh, that's a, that's a poisonous mushroom, don't eat that. It actually, if you cook it properly, it is 
edible. Um, these are Amanita muscaria stem pickles, super tasty. Um, and um, uh, let's see, this is my Tom Ka soup with, um, it's a Thai coconut soup with a chicken of the woods and my Taki mushrooms as well. And I always use a turkey tail broth for the base of my uh, soups. So, you know, you're, you're getting also not only the, you know, the nutritional part of the mushrooms, but also the, um, the uh, medicinal part too. So lots of those really good. Um, hey, just mean, one moment before you move forward. Yeah, sure. Um, it seems like whatever we did a few moments ago, the slides aren't going forward um, for us watching. So oh. maybe go back to what you were doing originally. All right, let's see. Um, oh, there we go. Oh, is that better? We can see the whole pictures now. And okay. it seems like it's at the Amanita muscaria pickles slide. Okay. So that, good. Now, all right. Now y'all know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, great. Okay, now, so here is your visual presentation of the Amanita muscaria pickles. <laughs> and then this is the other soup I was just babbling on about. Um, and then over here, a kind of take on your classic morels and uh, peas and ferns, um, you know, bracken ferns is what we have in Southern California. Uh, so I added those into them as well, um, in the, into this dish as well, along with, oh, and what I really enjoy is when certain plants also have a variety of different uh, ways they present themselves. Uh, these miner's lettuce um, leaves are pink. You know, there's a, a variety out here that we have some that are, um, I find these more in the sun. I'm not quite sure if it's a different, I don't think it's a different species, but I think it's as a result of their growing conditions. These are, I find out in the sun, a little bit more harsher environment um similar a little bit stronger flavored but i mean that pink come on you got that's um pretty interesting to be able to add that uh to the dish as well uh so yeah all about visual interests I'm, I'm a very visually focused creative type so if i can make it look good that's a huge portion of the game right you don't want a plate full of something that looks like lawn clippings. You want something that looks like you can walk into a five-star restaurant. Um, but then, you know, make sure the taste backs it up too. So that's that's an important part as well. Um, and then here we go. We've got, um, this was another crazy idea. These waffles here are made from a puff ball mushroom. Um, I had seen folks doing uh, pizzas from the giant puff balls, you know, slicing them and use the, using the slices as a base for a, uh, a pizza. You know, just put the sauce on and cook it all up and really, and the toppings and whatever. But I was like, you know, there's, some, there's gotta be something else. Cause you know, once you have a giant puff ball um, there's a lot to work with and you have a lot of options to do some creative different things. So I had this crazy idea to make a puffball waffle and um, it was quite tasty. You could go either savory or uh, sweet on that. This one, this one actually went a bit savory, you know, with some, um, uh, let's see, I believe that was a a black trumpet gravy I had made for it as well. So that was, that was good, pretty good. A little bit of chili pepper on there as well. Um, yeah, um, flavors, just super important. Um, working with different different kinds, you have know, totally different over here on the right-hand side with Matsutake. That one, you know, you're really wanting to preserve those very delicate flavors um, and, yeah, that one's that one's fun 
still still have some more work to do on on learning the matsutake flavors and such but um it's a great great journey and yeah so into um you know the culinary world has such a great um exploration that, that we're, i think we're just barely getting into with wild foods there's just a lot more to explore um and then medicinal mushrooms as as i was introduced earlier um you know i do have a master's degree in herbal medicine and that's where i really found my interest in mushrooms and i wrote many many of my um papers on mushrooms no sorry not on mushrooms but about mushrooms well okay most of the time sorry i that's if you've been in my class i make that joke often but anyways um you know it's quite interesting uh how you know we can use these mushrooms for um our um you know our health using them um, however all the different things you're seeing nowadays that the turkey tail is good for this and cordyceps is good for that and reishi is good for this um which i think it's great and all you can really fine tune certain issues that you may have and match it up to a certain mushroom um but i and i think a lot of people are using them prophylactically to prevent you know any sort of cancer or whatever we are you know we're in a time where um you know we we can use all the help we can get from the natural world but i think if you know just getting mushrooms into your diet is really um a pretty good idea a good thing to do um yes medicinal in all sorts of ways um i do teach a lot of classes on med about medicinal mushrooms um you know, for the mind, body, and spirit. So uh, we'll, we'll leave that at that and go into that in other, in my other classes, if you're interested. Um, yeah, the medicinal mushrooms are fantastic and there needs to be more research, I think. I think um, our modern research could really you know we've been using med, um, mushrooms medicinally for for quite some time you know throughout history and i feel like modern research um needs to catch up but you know it's there's a lot lot to continue to study out there on about mushrooms um let's see I think we're getting so we're gonna go till like what 11 40 or sorry um to about have 10 minutes before we end right for questions yeah i mean you could go all the way up until yeah about 10 minutes or so and we can ask a few questions so if people do have questions and want to drop them in the chat for jess um that would be amazing and i would be remiss not to say that um the forager summit banner <clears throat> um was designed by jess so big shout outs for that it's awesome <laughs> it worked magic oh good yeah <clears throat> yeah i um yeah that was fun i i do a lot of as you guys can see I, you know i do have an art background as well um and it does transfer aesthetically into all the things that i do um and yeah so I'm glad that worked out. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad this this is all happening. Yeah. Um, we are yeah, too. So, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, let's see. What else can I chat about? Yeah. Um, I did want to say I don't I don't know how many other mushroom presentations you've had, uh, but I feel like it's always important to bring up the fact that. You know there are a lot of toxic not a lot there there are a lot of mushrooms that you should not be eating and only a few um 
there are only a few deadly ones out there to really keep an eye on but um you know some people i feel like our fear of mushrooms is definitely overdone in um in our culture um i do you know like i do work with amanita muscaria a lot which a lot of people feel like that one's very deadly but it is not um there are deadly ones that you know they look just like your little brown mushrooms that don't really um you know they're not bright and colorful um and they can easily get mixed in with other ones um so definitely make sure you are identifying correctly working with local experts um local teachers to help you you know learn identification skills um yeah just a few more photos to finish up with um yeah it's quite always an adventure out in the wild and um yeah i don't know where i'm headed next as far as um yeah the journey of writing my book was pretty awesome um i did start out it was an initially started as a cookbook and working because it it is published by um a fairly big publishing company and you know once you're into that realm you are you know stuck with what they want and what they want to they think will sell best and, and originally i wanted to do a mushroom uh plant-based mushroom cookbook and they were like that's great your photography is great but we would actually like to do just an introductory um introductory guide to mushrooms so i did have to change a lot of my focus into um you know just mushroom photography for the book um and then you know but yeah it was great it was a great adventure um and you know i don't know where where the next one leads to i, I did talk to my agent last week and she's she thinks the mushroom thing is still um you know still popular still a thing to continue to pursue so maybe another um another mushroom book is gonna be in the works i don't know it's, there's so many so many things out there to really dive deep into um but uh yeah love to answer any questions um helps keep it going you guys have any questions brian and kyle you can keep this chat going <laughs> sure sure we can um we can go to the chat there's a couple of questions in there from some of the oh, audience sure. and uh um let's see i guess a couple people were asking about uh buying the book is there anywhere that you would like to send people as far as buying the book goes i can put that into the chat um well i i really do hate to send people to amazon it's not my you know favorite one um to do but you know you can get it on amazon definitely feel free to leave a review those really help out um getting um you know it makes my publisher think that things are doing well uh they that's what they look at it's unfortunately part of the the book publishing world um and i mean if you're local to la i will be at the la uh, mushroom fair next month and i will be signing and selling copies um but i know we're kind of worldwide here but um yeah or you can go directly to my publisher which is ww norton and also yeah i don't i don't sell them directly on my website because just because of the logistics and i'm never home so it would just it's where i'm at right now all right and once um, again or right, go ahead do you have something else um but i have seen it in so many stores even lots of your local independent stores are carrying it um i am which I'm really surprised, like I'll walk into a store and I'm like, hey, that's my book right there. It's such a crazy feeling. It's so crazy. Um, 
but yeah, so it, it's out there. It's out at Barnes and Noble. It's you can find it. You can order it wherever. Great. And once again, for everyone out there, it's called Mushroom Wonderland. So you can look that up at your local bookseller and find it there. Um, and anyway, we have a question here from uh, Evelina, I believe I'm pronouncing that okay. It says, uh, thank you, Jess, your pictures and recipes are amazing and very creative. Could you speak about mushroom harvesting ethics? Oh, very good question. Yeah. Um, that does kind of bring up a bit of, you know, lots of, well, actually brings up a lot of uh, concern. Um, as far as mushrooms themselves, you know, when you're picking a mushroom, really, you're actually helping it do its thing. You're, you're, as you pick it and carry it through the woods, you're releasing spores the entire way. You are helping it do, you know, that is the function of the mushroom. Um, but the biggest problem is the the foot traffic through the forest. Um, you know, the more and more foragers we have, more and more people who are curious about mushrooms are out there, you know, trampling, um, you know, not the, necessarily the mushrooms, but also, you know, delicate soil, um, you know, new growth and all the, all the other plants. You know, I see people just taking off into the woods and, you know, creating new trails that weren't there so and taking people taking big big groups out um you know it's okay it's all right you know one or two three people um but when you i've seen some people take classes of you know 20 30 40 people and they're all just walking through the woods um you know oh there's there we do have impact we do have impact on that um so I definitely say, you know, walk carefully, walk where you're walking, um, watch where you're walking, um, you know, be aware of your environment and the impact you have where we are, we have an impact no matter what, you know, we have an impact where we're sitting at home on our computer consuming electricity and consuming plastics and everything else, but we're not in the woods or we're in the woods and we're walking around and you know, no matter what, we are always having an impact. So being conscious of what that impact is uh, can, you know, set us in the right direction, I think. Yeah. But that's that, a good question. Yeah, that's, that's one that just continues to come up the more that we're presenting this information and um, as far as plants and mushrooms go, it's something that people are really curious about. So thanks for, for answering that. And this question might be kind of on the same um, same, wa same wavelength, um, but it says, since mushrooms and lichens are symbiotic, have you used them in your recipe? And I say that they're kind of on the same wavelength because of course lichens are so slow growing and something to be kind of careful of. But yeah, have you used those in your recipes at all? Um, not too much. Uh, the only lichens that I've used is the usnea mushroom, or it's not mushroom, sorry, like the usnea lichen uh, for medicinal purposes. You know, it's a it's an antibiotic, and I've I've used that a a little bit, but otherwise, yeah, lichens are so slow growing, and there's a lot of other one other you know mushrooms are fast growing and, and usually very plentiful. So yeah, the lichens, I'm not, um, not lichen using the lichens. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, another question here, um, this could be pretty broad. What is your biggest challenge when working with fresh mushrooms for recipes? Do you ever freeze them? Uh, you should see my freezer. <laughs> <laughs> it is jam packed uh, with frozen mushrooms. Not all mushrooms freeze well, um, but many do. So yeah, freezing is an excellent way to preserve them. You can cook them and then freeze them. Some you can put straight into the freezer. So, um, but um, really, 
yeah, it's definitely, yeah, you can totally freeze mushrooms. Uh, you do lose texture a bit, um, that kind of firmness, fresh, you know, it's always, always best, but you can make a soup stock, freeze it. That's a really great way to do it. Um, I have so many chicken of the woods in my freezer um, from the East Coast, actually, and because I much prefer those to the ones we have on the West Coast. And um, those are always nice to just pull out and have some, you know, fried chicken fingers anytime the, the urge comes. But um, yeah, so see, was there another I feel like, was there another part on that? Oh, my greatest challenge. Um, I would say my greatest challenge is having the energy to process a whole bunch of mushrooms after getting back from a very exhausting mushroom hunt. Um, as exciting as it can be to bring in, you know, 80 pounds of mushrooms, that means you have 80 pounds of mushrooms you have to clean <laughs> and figure out what the heck you're going to do with them um you know giving away to friends is a great idea you can really make good friends that way uh with the neighbors and people you know um but yeah the cleaning processing and keeping them fresh till you're ready to use them is definitely definitely a good challenge so, yeah. Certainly. Other... Um, my Cara is asking, uh, what is your favorite fungi and other foraged wild food combo meal? Great question. Ooh, I always, yeah, that's always a good question. What's my favorite mushroom? And it's, it really changes with the season because, you know, you get, you eat, say, you know, chanterelles for a long time. And then it's like a nice long season. You're eating them for every other meal. And it's like, okay, I don't, I don't like chanterelles anymore or morels or porcini. And it's like, you know, it kind of just goes with the seasons. Um, chanterelles though, I think would, be one of my best culinary mushroom. Um, that one's definitely up there as far as my favorite to eat. I just, something about, well, I mean, aesthetically, they're such a beautiful mushroom, especially the really large ones we get in uh, California. Um, but yeah, that, that would, I don't know. That's just a, such a tough, decision <laughs> sure sure any particular way you like to cook chanterelles to incorporate them into a dish i mean i barely just get them out of the pan you know fried in butter and sure. salt and they go right straight in my mouth <laughs> um but you know i definitely, <laughs> definitely wanting to work with that one a little bit more get a little bit more creative and see what kind of um how I can uh, work with those a little bit better. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the one uh, sort of different chanterelle dish I made this past summer was working with, um, kind of make them into something sweet. So I think I cooked them down with some, uh, I guess it was blackberries. Yeah, it was blackberries. Oh, that and, sounds uh, really tasty. It was great because they can kind of lend themselves to being a little sweeter. So um absolutely yeah that was nice but y'all yeah you're you're really rocking it over there with the, the uh cantharellas californicas the really large chanterelles um which are really incredible but uh yeah i'm not seeing any other questions someone posted uh the link to your book we can go find that um mm. and people are just thanking you and you know There's, just giving um, you high praise on your photography of course Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, here's a, here's a photo of my book. Um, and then, yeah, it's um, Much in Wonderland, a forager's guide to finding, identifying, and using more than 25 wild fungi. Um, 
and yeah i'm i'm on instagram a bit uh, that's where you can find me find my photos and such um, and then for any of my classes or other offerings i do have a um an intensive wild food program not just mushrooms but we also go into all the wild edibles of of california it's you know based in southern california um, but you can find all that on my website at jstarwood.com and then just uh, great okay well, um, i wanted to actually really just say thank you i really appreciate you know your aesthetic and your pictures and everything and you know it, it especially when you're using the wild foods and you're you're making these gourmet meals and it just looks so amazing and delicious and you know it, it lets people know that it's not just a bunch of weeds and it's not some weird hippie thing you know it's like actually a gourmet um gourmet ingredients that are available all around so i really love looking at your pictures oh thank you yeah you know kind of the idea behind it too is that you know if you want somebody to care about your the environment and find value in it you know because we we want to protect things we find value in and if you show people like oh you can eat this and it like literally looks like like you just weeded your lawn or your garden um your people aren't going to care but if it looks like it costs a million dollars at a, a restaurant then it's like oh wait a minute, you know, and then the, the thinking changes and like, hey, maybe this is actually important. Maybe there's something to, of value here in this empty lot or, you know, this, you know, this untouched land that, oh, maybe there's, you know, value to it. So, yeah. Thanks. Appreciate your appreciation of of my work. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. I guess we'll let you get back to um, to hunting those truffles. And I'll be <laughs> curious to see, uh, see some photos of, of what you find. That's so fascinating. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, cool. Just a bunch of whites so far. It would be really great to have some black truffles, but We'll see. We'll see. Might be a little early. Right on. Well, good luck with it. And uh, feel free to hang out. And we got another great mushroom presentation coming up right after this. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Jess. And um, I've included all your uh, information for people to get in touch and buy books and sign up for workshops in the chat. Um, so hopefully some people will be coming your way from this. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking again at some point soon. So thank you. All right. Sounds wonderful. Thank you.